So first we have this two-hour session. Uh, Philip is moderating today, so I'm going to hand over to you, Philip, now. I think all the panellists have joined online pretty much, so we are ready to go. Uh, there may be, there are a lot of people coming in remotely for this session from different parts of the world, uh, but hopefully all will go smoothly, and I'll hand over to you, Philip, to take us through this session. Thank you. So first of all, a big applause virtually also for that wonderful performance. Uh, wonderful, it's a way to start our session. Um, I'm Philip, with Philip the Chief of the Sports Section at UNESCO Headquarters, and I will have the pleasure of moderating this session today. UNESCO is here giving support and patronage for this event, because for us, this is a critical moment for sport funding and sport for development projects. As I hope you will see today, there are some really exciting models available now that are flexible, transferable, and stronger every year. To introduce this event further, I'm pleased to ask the brilliant organizing team now to feature a video by the UNESCO Assistant Director General for Social and Human Sciences, Gabriela Ramos. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to join you today on the opening day of sports, human rights, and sustainable development. And to welcome you to our session, exactly on that, measurement and data for scaling investment in sports for development. This event truly embodies what it means to be connecting minds and creating the future, as Dubai Experts has said so well. Even more, this event could not come at a better time. The ongoing pandemic has seen a 41 decline in physical activity and a staggering 200% increase in youth mental health conditions. These challenges make sports development more vital than ever. Moreover, the data ecosystem has been evolving just as quickly, and it is time to share with you our newest tools to turn this situation around. As Assistant Director General for Social and Human Sciences, which is UNESCO lead sector for sports, I want to thank the Irish Pavilion for hosting this event and commend the Irish government for sharing UNESCO's vision for sports and development. Together with UNESCO, UEFA, the Commonwealth, our dear UNESCO chair, and the coalition secretariat, we form a community that truly realizes the power of grassroots sports to be an enabler for development. We thank all of you for championing this session. Of course, development is about infrastructure, it's about skills, it's about societies coming together, and all of this is about sports. Sport is an enabler of development, not only contributing to the 2030 agenda, but it's also showing time and time again that more and more research reveals a profound connection between sports and sustainable development. By being here today, you are, you are going to see how much the cutting edge data is already turning into successful investment partnerships. It is real, it is open source, it's scalable, and we are bringing it to you today because we have been working for some time to produce this uh, data. And by mobilizing new financial instruments like social outcome contracts, we are developing reliable ways to put verified dollar values next to the social, economic, and health benefits of sports participation. These numbers can be surprising, staggering. For example, a recent valuation of amateur football participation in Europe was not just in the millions per year, but in the tens of billions. Imagine what in that investment means in our societies. And projects like these mark an important cornerstone of UNESCO's larger new, larger new program, Fit for Life. Fit for Life, which is promoting sports. And Fit for Life is about realizing sports' full potential through smart investments, which deliver outcomes in all of the areas that I have mentioned, in health, in education, in equality. It does this by supporting the development of inclusive sports policies increasing grassroots participation, and better equipping teachers to build back better. Integration is the name of the game here. 
The social and human sciences section is passionate about making human lives better through evidence-based policy making, considering all the societal needs. To amplify impacts, we need to connect the different stakeholders, new data sets, policy level, system level, and local change. Fit for Life provides a practical, action-oriented framework to do all this. As a continuation of our Kazan Action Plan, we want to support governments and businesses to walk the talk, giving them the tools to realize their funding needs. We aim to launch a coalition of public and private sector partners and to establish baseline data to support the smart investment at policy and practice level, and we count on you on this network of champions. This is the way forward, to bring concrete information and data, evidence, on a sports impact to investors and governments in order to scale up vital investment in sports for development. It is the reason UNESCO is here today, and we're so eager to hear your perspective as well as of those of today's presenters. The theme of this session will be a central theme of our overcoming MINEPS 7 conference. MINEPS is a big global conference of ministers of sports and practitioners and sports people and to so many projects going forward. That is why your contributions today and in the upcoming weeks and months are so important. And by he being here today, you show leadership in the domain of sports and investment. We count on that leadership to advance this program. You can also count on UNESCO to really realize the power of sports for development. Thank you. So I'm coming back in again, and I just wanted to highlight that the agenda we're discussing today is supported at highest levels within UNESCO, as you've just seen, through this intervention from our assistant director general. Good news for all of you, we won't have many videos remaining, but there's one remaining. I hope it will be uh, uh, going smoothly this time. Um, this is the introduction from our representatives from the Irish Minister of State with responsibility for sport, Mr. Jack Chambers. Can we please see this video? The last two years have been challenging for everyone, and we've seen how quickly our world can be impacted by one issue. But of course, there are many other important global issues and challenges that we must address and I believe that sport can play an important role in that regard. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak today on this really important session on measurement and investment. As Minister for Sport here in Ireland, one of my key priorities is to see more people participating in sport. In Ireland we've set a target of, uh, to have 60% of our population participating in sport and physical activity by the year 2027. We are all aware of the health benefits of active participation in sport, but whether it's through active participation or social participation, it is clear that everyone in our society can achieve huge benefits. Ensuring that investment in sport properly recognises such benefits is a challenge facing us all. Sport is at the heart of communities throughout Ireland and it plays a key role in bringing individuals together and forging that community spirit. Three out of five people here in Ireland regularly participate in sport, either actively or socially. However, it is essential that sport can demonstrate the return it can offer on investment if we are to continue to grow funding for the sector. As you know, sport can deliver tangible benefits to wider society in terms of health outcomes, social inclusion and community engagement. Providing evidence to prove these benefits should underpin sustained long-term investment in sport, both for its own sake and for all the other positive outcomes it can deliver. We need good data and monitoring to help us in our aims and to know if we are delivering the right results and we need tools that will help us to gather and interpret that data. This can then help us to make explicit links between investments in sport and public policy goals, for instance in areas such as tackling obesity, 
educational attainment and many other areas. Last November I joined with the Football Association of Ireland in launching their Social Return and Investment Report which measures the value of football participation in Ireland. The report produced some very interesting and important data and I know that Lee McGroarty will talk more about this shortly so I'll just mention some of the key findings. The report estimates the economic impact uh, of the social benefits of participation in football in Ireland at more than 300 million euro per annum, the economic impact of volunteering at more than 200 million euro each year and annual healthcare savings of more than 1 billion euro. When this is extrapolated out across all sports, the argument for sustained investment in sport becomes absolutely compelling. The challenge of course is presenting it in a clear manner supported by evidence and research. Last year we completed a study on the value of sport in Ireland which provided very valuable data. The study showed that consumer expenditure and sport related goods and services in Ireland in 2018 was 3.3 billion euro or 3.1% of total consumers expenditure. The number of people employed in sport was more than 64,000 or 2.8% of all employment here in Ireland. And in healthcare the report found that 97,000 cases of disease were prevented in Ireland in 2019 from sport and physical activity participation equivalent to 0.4 billion in net healthcare savings. For government it is so important for us to have access to data like this, it is clear that sport is making a significant contribution to our country in economic and social terms. Of course it is hard to measure the enormous sense of enjoyment and national pride from the many recent successes of our sports men and women and the performance of our national men's and women's teams. Many would say that is the greatest contribution of all. In Ireland I am proud to say that we are making great strides in relation to sport. Sport. In 2018 we have launched a new national sports policy for the period up to 2027 and in November I launched a sports action plan with over specific 40 specific actions for implementation by 2023. The availability of good evidence-based data has been a key element in delivering increased government investment in sport over the last number of years and will be a very key important feature for future progress as well. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Chambers, for these uh, very inspiring remarks. And that I think illustrate that our session today is so well placed in the Irish Pavilion at the World Expo. So thank you again, and I will move on now to Mr. Susumu Katsunada, Senior Assistant Director in the Japan International Cooperation Agency, who is here also representing JICA's membership in the Development Bank's Coalition for Sustainable Development through Sport. Mr. Katsunada, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much for the introduction and the good, uh, good afternoon. My name is Susumu Katsumata, who is in charge of sports and development in JICA, Japan. It is an honor to speak to you today. So, as, uh, as, as co chair of the Coalition for Sustainable Development through Sport, I'd like to thank the, the Irish Pavilion for, for hosting this wonderful event. It is so timely for investors wanting to make their mark in sport for development. The coalition that I co-chair is an assembly of development banks, including AFD of France, ALIDE Latin America, ADF IMI uh, Israel, Institut Peru Credito Sportivo Italy, the West, West African Development Bank and VEP of Russian Federation. It was brought to life by AFD at the Financing Common Summit, which gathered more than 450 development banks for the first time in history. I want to commend AFD for having promoted sport as a business case for development banks in this prestigious context. The coalition also includes experts and sport organizations, including UNESCO, who chair one of two working groups on maximizing the impact of sport on the SDGs. Together, we bring so much to the table. We come together to foster collective capacities, develop, develop joint projects, and to investigate new trends in the market 
like the outcome-based contrast you will hear about today. The coalition is very excited about the potential for these instruments to change investment in this field. And our second working group coordinated by UNESCO have agreed on a plan to develop a social outcome contrast related to sport. We are hopeful that new innovative tools and proofs or concepts will be launched in the course of 2022. With this in mind, the coalition has reached out to other banks with interest in this field, including the Development Bank of Latin America, the IDB, the AEB, and the Islamic Development Bank. This composition is reflective of the current landscape development funding for sport. A core team of innovators and many newcomers to this exciting field. But few things must happen for us to scale up our investment. The first is to test and create usable data <coughs> for sport funding in a low risk situation. The second is to share and build collective capacity. Our starting point is to learn from the success stories of the innovators that we will hear that we will hear from later today. Furthermore, we are in a stage of innovation where pioneers are motivated to share and develop our exciting new financial instruments, export networks, and assets that will be made available to a wide array pioneers in the field of sport. We at JICA grow the efforts of cooperation to foster collaboration among stakeholders for the promotion of peace through sports. JICA will spare no efforts promoting human security through active participation in the sports and development issue. The cooperation is a very important, a very important moment of my life. We are at now an early stage of innovation and development and are ready to share our knowledge, our experiences and our success in order to innovate and grow collectively. To all colleagues, dignitaries and partners here today, thank you for coming and sharing your voices at this important time. And to those of you who represent banks in the sphere. I welcome you as potential partners of this in the coalition. I wish you a most instructive and inspiring session. Thank you and good day. Sharing the stage with so many champions in the field of development funding, and I don't use that term lightly, champions. I firmly believe that sport can be a vital tool for development goals in almost every context, but it needs champions who are willing to bring it to this level, and it needs to be done right. It needs to be promoted from the grassroots level, and the funding chain that supports those grassroots projects needs to be strong, secure, reliable, and appealing to public and private investors. This push for integration and new strategies will be core at our upcoming World Conference of Sport Ministers that Mrs. Ramos mentioned earlier on, and this session is an important step in the build-up to that event. UNESCO is so happy to share this work with you today because we are finally at the point where we have the financial instruments needed for this. They are real, they are effective, and they provide fabulous rates of return for governments and investors. I don't exaggerate. But don't take my word for it today to get to hear from the programs and investors themselves. In the next 30 minutes, you're going to hear from pioneers, trailblazers in the field of sport for development. You will hear from our colleagues at UEFA, whose model for social return on investment is not only rigorous and backed by world and world class team of academics, but it is proven to be an effective on the ground. You're going to hear this first time from Joe Lockley, an athlete and founder of the company Bright Star, a service delivery partner that received money from substances, chances, social outcome and contracting. You're going to hear how this success happened at every level, from the ground level with Mr. Lockley all the way up 
to the development of this contract by opening that substance. You're going to hear it from Sergio Sanchez, the head of Big Issue Invest, who will hopefully confirm what is most important. That sport for development is an excellent business case. We are all excited to hear how this funding model worked out, but I want you all to keep in mind as we watch this session, how could a model like this be taken on by my government, my organization, or in my hometown? We at UNESCO truly believe that contracts like, like these are the way forward. They are data-driven, innovative, and transferable to a variety of diverse contexts. Please welcome with me our first speakers, Leah McRorty, Strategic Development Manager from UEFA, and an Irishman, as well as Tim Trubbett, Chief Executive from Substance. Liam, Tim, over to you. UEFA started this work uh, in 2017, and we had 55 members, and within those 55 members, we could see that there were enormous differences between governments in terms of how they support grassroots football and grassroots sports. The countries that supported grassroots football performed better on the world stage in both male and female football and across sports, and they were also financially sustainable sports sectors. The UEFA SROI model was designed to offer a business case to government as to why it makes financial sense to invest in grassroots sports. As Minister Chambers mentioned earlier on, and as most ministers know, we need evidence of impact and money talks. The model we have developed can be applied to all sports and we have shared with all the big team sports. Today, the Irish rugby have just started applying the model to amateur rugby in Ireland. Dr. Tim Crabb is the chair of the academic panel that guides the development of the model. So I'm going to pass it on to him who will give us some of the details and I hope I can share my screen. I'll pick up the story from here, Liam. Thanks for the introductory remarks. Um, so yeah, my name's Tim Crabb. Um, I have the, the pleasure of leading the team at, at Substance, which uh, is an organization that works at the, I guess, the interface of technology, social impact, um, and, and value in the sport for development sector. And um, when we think about these issues of the, the social value of sport, um, I, I make no bones about the fact that I'm a passionate follower of football and I believe in um, many of the, the merits of people playing and, and watching the game, as do many people involved in, in the sport. But I guess the challenge that we had is to move beyond the idea of people who are involved in sport have a, having a feeling of the benefits of, of sport to move into a situation where we know and can be certain about the, the benefits of, of, of sport. Um, and so since 2017, um, we've collectively been working with, with, with colleagues at, at, at UEFA and, and others uh, to develop a, a social return on investment model that puts a monetary value on the outcomes uh, that football participation um, drives. And essentially to make the case for investment um, in the sport, which is based on evidence rather than belief. Um, and so I guess that it, it was critical um, for us in, in, in moving forward um, with that challenge that the, the model that we, we developed uh, would stand up to uh, interrogation um, at the highest levels of inspection um, in order that it might gain the confidence of, of government uh, and international organizations such as the World Health Organization um, and United Nations. Um, you see in the, the slide something of the, the basis of, um, of that model, and I'm sure that more detail is going to be presented um, in a deck uh, after this event um, that will talk through some of the, the methods that, that sit behind the model. Um, but I think that what's important to understand is that the model didn't just emerge out of nothing. It builds upon the, the highest quality um, sets of data, the most recognized sets of data internationally, um, the best peer-reviewed uh, research evidence, um, and it, it essentially um, builds a, a model which is then underpinned and, and overseen by an advisory panel um, of world-class academics who both have, have guided us to the, to the right data, um, assessed the methods, and endorsed um, the, the findings. 
the results that have emerged from um, the, the, the work that we've been able to, to, to apply have been so powerful in securing uh, investment, also in changing perceptions of football and sport, um, moving beyond the idea of, of elite performance towards the, the social and global benefits that sport can deliver, and in changing the ways in which um, sport is, is delivered, that there's been a growing demand at, at national, uh, international, um, regional, city um, and club levels, as well as, as Liam suggested, from, from other sports. So um, through the development um, of the model, we, we were able to develop a, an online platform which enables remote data collection, analysis and reporting to create a sustainable, um, scalable solution. And, you know, I can now sort of let you know that we are already delivering uh, this model uh, in over more than 40 of the, um, the national territories um, or member countries um, of UEFA. The most recent of which um, was the results that we presented in the Republic of Ireland that we heard the minister speaking about previously, where um, we were able to calculate the the value of participation in grassroots football, not elite football, not professional football, but grassroots football in Ireland at 1.8 billion euros annually. Uh, and also to, to show how that value and where it comes from can be broken down in terms of the contributions that are coming from um, the economic contributions, the social benefits and health benefits. To be able to dig into that data more um, uh, granular in a more granular fashion to understand how many cases of particular negative health conditions have been prevented, which is driving um, that value. Um, now we're in a situation where the, the model uh, and this scalable um, uh, way of delivering things has enabled us to apply um, at regional and club levels, as well as to extend the model to, to other sports, um, including, as, as Liam mentioned, rugby union, but also considerations for, for badminton uh, and also American football, which is something that, as Liam suggested, UEFA welcomes. But I think what's important for the rest of this, this session is that um, these developments have opened up perhaps even unintended consequences, the opportunities, if you like, to think about um, new ways of financing investment um, in sport through social outcomes contracting. Um, for, for 20 years, um, Substance and the colleagues that, that work there have been learning about and evaluating the impact of, of sport for development programmes. And we've long advocated a focus on outcomes and payment by results models, but traditional funding models haven't enabled um, that approach to be taken forward. But I think we now stand at a, at a moment where the emergence of, of social outcomes contracting, um, or what some people refer to as social impact bonds, and the intersection of the use of technology to gather data, the impact measurement skills that we have developed, UEFA's investment um, in a social valuing model to put a price, if you like, on the achievement of different outcomes has enabled us certainly at Substance to think about putting a, a foot forward um, and to, to design a social outcomes contract which is made um, to, to fit, made to the footprint really of the sport for development sector. Um, that programme um, we have called Chances um, and my colleagues are now going to take you through the journey of the development of the Chances programme, the possibilities that the approach um, is opening up. And so you will hear uh, today from managers of the programme, um, those involved in making sure that um, the work happens. Um, you will hear from, um, from Joe in terms of the delivery and what that means for organisations on the ground. And you will hear from um, funders and why this model is attractive um, to them. But first of all, I'd like to introduce you to Sangeeta Patel, um, who is the, um, the head of programmes at Substance. I'm speaking to you about our experiences in managing the Chances Social Outcomes contracts. Um, Chances is really a model that's made up of 41 different organisations um, across the country who have um, come together for a shared purpose to tangibly improve the lives of young people. Big issue invest are our social investor who, after engaging with our sport and development business case, granted us a loan of 1.25 million for the upfront working capital to kickstart um, the programme. 
Chances are 16 delivery organisations known to us as the providers. They're sport and youth agencies with experience in sport for development. They vary in size, in capacity and turnover, and really kind of illustrate that there is no one size that fits all. Collectively, our providers are tasked with engaging up to 6,000 young people across the country to achieve outcomes that deliver social impact and cost benefit to our commissions. Increasing physical literacy, reducing offending, improving school attendance, and reducing the number of young people who are neat, i.e. not in education, training and employment, are the costed outcomes that make up the chances model, and each one requires evidence and verification to ensure that they are paid for. As outcomes are achieved, outcome payers, known to us as the commissioners, they pay per outcome. They have collectively committed 4.1 million um, pounds, and this revenue, once it's uh, generated, is used as operational running costs. So it's effectively maintaining the SOC uh, outcomes contract model. So substance is shown in this diagram as the intermediary, and our role is to enable the model to run smoothly. We bring together the capabilities that Tim has just described, um, data, technology, performance management, and research in order to do this. Our goal here is to drive, is to achieve social impact, why, social impact whilst driving up efficiency. We're able to do that really effectively by using the mechanism of results-based finance. We're incentivizing our providers, encouraging them to innovate, be flexible, and really enabling them to be better at doing more good. We also want to ensure and secure good return on investment for our uh, social investor. We pay the loan back to big issue with interest and on time. So chances is predicated on a really rigorous financial cash flow model. It's really a vital tool that we use in running the contract. It governs and sets our framework for performance indicators. I'm really delighted, as Tim said, that our investment manager, Sergio, from Big Issue is going to be speaking to you shortly about their engagement with uh, chances. So whilst outcomes-based work is familiar to the UK sport for development sector, many, are pro pro many of our providers are new to working in this combination, results-based finance and designing for outcomes. So there has been a change management piece. We've been building the capacity of our providers to manage the shift from traditional service delivery funding models to working in a really efficient social outcomes contracting way. Without necessarily having a blueprint ourselves or a precedent to follow, we have, we've had to unpick some complex questions and provide answers along the way. We've embedded an impact in the process evaluation that enables us to piece together the optimal conditions to achieve the best possible results. We're aiming to keep the model, the model tight and really minimize any leakage. Our smallest chances provider probably packs the biggest punch and today has been one of our most successful deliveries. Brightstar has been mentioned. They're a nimble, agile boxing club who after only eight months have achieved um, successful outcomes to the maximum claim value. I'm gonna let Joe talk, talk you through how he's done that. Our day-to-day -day role really is managing and processing a multitude of financial transactions and this is possible through the continuous cash flow modelling and outcomes tracking. Engagement with commissioners is also really important, important, and we're realistic about this situation. Working with one government department in a results-based way doesn't necessarily give us the licence to leapfrog or bypass kind of whole administrative processes. So we are impacted by bureaucracy and we take that into consideration. We do our best to expedite situations and to keep processes moving. Thanks, Liam. Just the next one. So here I'd just finally like to give you an example of how one chances outcome interfaces across the model. In the development of chances, we prepared a business case, a value proposition for government agencies to assist them to reduce incidents of youth offending. The rate card was developed. This is a menu of outcomes that defines how much uh, how much commissioners are prepared to pay for each outcome. And that was developed using UK economic data. We then tested the rate card with local government agencies and defined an eligible target group. In chances, 
These are young people who have offended or are engaged in the youth justice system. Every time a young offender is in contact with the police, probation, the court system, a social worker, a safeguarding team, there is a cost to their local authority. So you can see easily how the potential cost, how the potential cost saving here can be quite significant. Eligible young people are identified by the services that I've just mentioned, and the young person is assessed. This is a really important step in the process. Is the intervention suitable for the young person and therefore likely to be successful? How will the young person be safeguarded? The provider engages the young person in chances they, they engage for up to 12 months. And throughout this time, the provider remains in contact with the police and the authorities to gather the data and the evidence. The evidence to qualify whether the outcome has been achieved comes from the police or a statutory service. The metric that we use is the duration of non-offending and subsequently we calculate the number of claimable outcomes and pay presto, we invoice the commissioner. The generated income is then put back into the model to continue to pay the service provider. And finally, we bring all of this together through reporting, governance and accountability with all partners. So that equally, going back to that partnership of 41 delivery organisations, equally we can share in the challenges and the successes of the programme as we progress. Joe, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, we will go over to the next highest of this construct, which is our, our core model. I'm happy to introduce you to Joe Lockheed from Brighton. Thank you very much. And I guess to understand how it's working on the ground, it's really important that you understand how we've grown as an organisation in direct relation to this social uh, investment bond. Um, just 18 months ago, we had two full-time members of staff, one part-time member of staff, and we're working with just over 100 uh, referrals, which is young people from disadvantaged backgrounds. Now, as I stand here, we have 32 volunteers, we have 12 full-time members of staff, including myself, I transitioned with this, and we're working with 415 uh, vulnerable young people on a referral basis, as well as many more through the open sessions too. And I guess for you to understand this organisation, you just need to understand our why. Um, and when we started in 2016, there were um, young people in the local area of Shropshire, which a lot of people won't have heard of, it's very rurally isolated. And a lot of people don't spot the issues that happen in there, where it varies from uh, a lot of your inner cities we're working with uh, the most number, uh, in the shop here, there's the most number of care homes than anywhere else in the UK. And there's a huge issue around uh, criminal exploitation as well. Um, so there's a lot of complex trauma happening. And there were, some, there were six young people in the local area that weren't engaged in any other services. They said they refused any counselling and, and they refused to, to get involved in anything. Uh, a parent came up to me and said, Joe, you're a boxer. We teach them how to box, they need discipline. All the teachers said we don't want them to learn boxing because if we teach them boxing they will then learn to be more violent towards their peer groups and towards their carers. What we found is that what boxing did, what the sport did, by me just holding the pads at first them, it allowed them a safe space to be themselves, to open up. It really allowed them to meet that sense of belonging and that need that they really needed like sport can do on such a huge level. It allowed them to express what was overwhelming them in the moment and they couldn't really express their anxiety in any other ways that they knew. Help them regulate emotions, change their physiology, and in result, face their fears. From them six, five of them are still working with us now. Um, three of them are actually coaches and mentors for other young people, and they have made huge changes. Not only that, they completely transformed their attendance and everything else going on within a school environment and their home environment too. So that's why this social investment bond was so interesting to us. To us, it allowed us to work in a really unique way, which is the way we do things. It allowed us to not just kind of look how cities would take this on, how we can really shape it to the need of the local people and shape that from the bottom up. That's why I was very excited about this opportunity. So for us, the social investment fund looks like this. We'll engage young people and it will be on a small scale where we'll work with eight to 12 per, per session and a session is five hours. We'll run 15 to 20 sessions per week. We can pull them outside of school, which a lot of people would think is 
is bad for their education. Actually, we have proved that that is helping increase their attendance and increase in how well they are actually doing in the school environment, as the stats will show as well. We work with them on three elements, boxing, education, and mentoring. We found that by starting the day and after lunch having boxing, they completely transform who they are throughout the rest of the day. The mentoring element helps it feel like a family when they're discussing problems that are happening in their lives that they think they're isolated with, and actually others are open up as well. All of the coaches have lived experience in either exploitation or they have lived experience in mental health diagnosis, and they can really be empathetic with young people. The mentoring helps them look at how their thoughts are leading to their feelings. We look at cognitive behavior as a whole. We explore positive relationships, role models, and have the conversations that no one else is having with these young people, with people that are their role models. And then we also offer education. So we help young people that really have had a lot of trauma in their life, show them that they can still thrive regardless of what they've been through. You know, one quote on the screen there from Ollie is, I thought I was stupid because I wasn't doing well in school. Now I see I can use my skills elsewhere and there's things that I can be great at. And that is Ollie. I'll tell you the story about him in, in a second. But um, I just think really to really kind of get emphasis of what we're doing, just hear some quotes. I, said, I told some of the parents, some of the teachers and some of the young people that I was coming here to talk to you guys today. And do any of them want to talk? All of them wanted to actually say a quote. So what I've done is I've pulled three quotes uh, from some of the young people. So firstly, from a parent, a parent has said, thank you for giving me my son back. We were, we were starting to lose hope, but now he has so much love, focus, and determination. We know that he can achieve every goal that you helped him set. A student said, I don't know where I would be if, it, if I wasn't here, to be honest. I don't like to think about the road I was heading. I didn't even realize it was what I needed, but for the first time ever, I feel like I belong somewhere. Uh, one of the teachers, said the students are engaged in achieving far more than we could ever imagine. They are achieving so much more in school and have literally proved so many people wrong um, and will continue to do so. It has made our jobs as teachers so much easier. Thank you. So as mentioned, having the outcomes focused social investment bond really means that we can be flexible with our delivery. It means that we can suit the delivery to the needs of the young people in our area, which means when it comes to impact measurement, we have to be really disciplined which is really important because we can really show what we have, whether it is working, isn't working, and flex the delivery to the needs to make sure it does work. We can work with the Shropshire Council and with the local people to actually show what we're doing and really help shape strategy. Also, share all the values and all our learning with people all across the, uh, the country as well. Um, I talked about Ollie a second ago, and I think just to really understand this model, you just need to understand his journey. Ollie hadn't attended school for nine months at all, he was associated with a problematic peer group, and it was because of a lot of trauma he faced in the past. Ollie said that he had no hope. He might as well get involved in this sort of behavior because he had no hope in life. What we were able to do with Ollie is we believed in him when no one else did. With enough belief, he was able to believe in himself. We were able to meet his sense of belonging and then help him to become the best version of himself that he could be. He went to a pupil referral unit, and then within a month was able to go back into a mainstream school because of the changes he's made. And now he's volunteering and helping with other young people as well. So our three words that we live by as part of this and as part of everything is believe, belong, become. Thank you. I'm not there yet. Um, I think it's, take it as a challenge. I am a investment manager um, and the team specialist in uh, social outcomes contracts or social impact loans. It's an honor to be here um, with all of you, bringing you today's presentation. Um, it's not intended to dig into the detail of the mechanics of um, these types of outcomes investments, um, as we don't, we sadly don't have enough time uh, to get into that detail today, um, but please reach out if you're interested in them um, and discussing a bit further. Um, my email address is in the uh, previous uh, slide, and I'm always happy to have a chat offline. Uh, these slides are a an overview of what um, uh, social investment is for us in BGC Invest uh, and some background on who BGC Invest is as a social investor. 
in, uh, in essence, uh, social investment should be about providing more patient and reliable capital for the voluntary sector, charities, and social enterprises. Um, there's something is a misconception that a social investment is not a grant or a donation, it's repayable finance. Um, social investors, uh, such as us, expect the funds back with some returns. Um, the difference with more traditional investors is that we expect two debts of, of returns. Uh, in our case, first and foremost, we expect uh, positive social change in, as the social return and also some financial returns. If we put those two motivations on a scale, uh, depending on where the weight is placed, we talk about the spectrum of capital. Um, and our capital is geared more towards the impact driven uh, focus. Um, because invest is an, an unique position as investor, uh, we're um, PCSE in our core and face similar challenges as our um, other businesses. Um, moving on, um, I wanted to give you a little bit of background. Um, those of you who are based in the UK um, will likely know who the big issue is, or may have seen one of our vendors on our streets. Big issue group is one of the world's best known businesses tackling the issue of poverty and inequality in the UK. Uh, our vendors buy the ma our magazine for £1.5 and sell it uh, to the public for £3, meaning that each seller that we support becomes a micro entrepreneur who is working at no paying. Uh, since uh, the launch of the magazine, we have supported over uh, 100,000 vendors selling over 200 million copies. This is, this is important and very important for us in the approach we take to invest in and manage investments because we share the same values and mission as the Big Easy Group and the magazine. Our funds don't come from the sales of the magazine, um, but we share that vision and the heritage of social enterprise and that sets us apart from other investors. I will very quickly skip through this slide, conscious of the time, um, which is high level overview, not exhaustive, of the type of investors in our funds. Um, we have three different investment teams, uh, the team where I sit, the fund management team, we provide direct loans from 200,000 pounds up to 3 million, and we also provide investment for our country's contracts. Uh, we have another uh, other couple of teams, CSB and lending teams providing smaller um, investments and, and small funding. And um, moving on, on to the uh, nitty gritty. Um, within the spectrum of capital mentioned earlier, our funds are weighted more towards the impact driven focus. That means we, as an investor, only invest into opportunities that actively seek to create solutions to social problems. And that is actively seek to create those solutions and not creating those solutions as a byproduct. Um, or they try to find better ways to tackle an existing, uh, an existing issue. How we achieve this? We achieve this by placing impact first. Um, that, that's, a, that's an easy thing to say, but how does that look in, in real practical terms? If we can take the, the Chances program as an example, uh, we're here because we invest in, in that great program. Um, and it's a program that actively pushes to help young people become more engaged in community communities by using sport. Our impact uh, investment thesis uh, assesses both the social and financial returns of the opportunities of, you know, of, of an investment such as the Chancellor Program, but it starts with a social impact assessment that scores um, an opportunity on how effective and or inclusive is to achieve its social goals. We provide investments with an impact rating uh, how that means how impactful it is addressing an SDG. In this case, um, chances for instance, SDG three, good health and well-being. We provide it or give it a, an impact rating that helps us make a decision. And it not just makes us help an um, investment decision. It's actually for us a go no go test. If an opportunity doesn't um, qualify or doesn't pass our well, well, yeah, the technology issue. We have to come to a conclusion of this part because we're already way beyond schedule. Apology. No worries. Can, can I just quickly, um, very quickly, just highlight um, the approach we take to investment is very, very heavy on cooperation of solutions and creating long term uh, service innovations, um, providing technical assistance and advisory support uh, from our experience uh, is sometimes uh, valued more um, highly than 
uh, providing capital itself and being uh, with our investors throughout the journey of investment. Um, I said, you have my contact details. Um, I'm afraid we don't have one time, but please reach out and we can have a um, conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Joe. Um, you have raised a lot of effort, I believe. Uh, I, I also believe you're not alone. Mind you are innovators, but there are more and more companies that invest in uh, in social investments, uh, such as yourself. So thanks again, and we'll go to some uh, concluding remarks from, from the other two. Please. So I'm just going to show I can take two minutes, uh, Philip, that uh, the horse wants to put on the video, that's fine. So the model that we developed is built on the, a lot of great work done by the SDGs, the, the Millennium Development Goals and the Kazan Action Plan. Um, it's, it's based on science and econometrics, it's not based on ERC. Um, it it rolls a number of questions for us within sport. Is sport being effective as it should be? If we design sport differently, can it be more effective? Can it be like sport for development? And second, the last question is probably the most important. Is there a better way to invest and to increase investment in sport? Our vision is that we would design sports clubs with, with, that will have social outcomes as their primary focus. Just as Joe mentioned, design from the bottom up, a boxing club can have far bigger impact for people who need the support the most. And then is, is there a way to, to finance this? As Sergio mentioned, can we attract investors who care about a return and the social outcome? We are very fortunate that, European, fortunate that the European Investment Bank is going to support the testing of these concepts in two countries, in Romania and Finland, and not just in food, not just in all sport. The questions they want to ask is, can governments change from an input funding model uh, to a, a payment by result model? What is like the doctor, the teacher, the police officer, apart from with a sports entity for joint partners? Is there an interest from the private sector to invest? And what are the obstacles in that country to prevent, that would prevent investment? Can we use the SROI model across the globe to develop rate cards for specific outcomes in specific contexts for specific demographics? And is this idea scalable? Um, in the next few months, Finland will apply to the, S, to the EIB um, via their Ministry for Education, and their focus will be on preventing exclusion. Romania most likely the Minister for Health will, will apply to the EIB for support on this concept in terms of women's and girls' physical and activity rates. Other conversations are taking place in Ireland, the Netherlands and around the world with development banks in Africa and Latin America. The rate card which comes from the SROI model is the thing that can start the conversation. The final point I have is that all of this is transferable to all sports and in all parts of the world. You we are very happy to make what we have done available to every sport. We don't want us to replicate what we have done. We want to build on the great work of the UN SDGs, Kazan, and then so on. And uh, that's a very quick summary at the end of the effort. Thanks so much, Leo, Sergio, Tim, Sangeeta, and Joe for, for bringing us closer to this innovative environment. 30 minutes is not doing justice to everything we need to learn and understand, but I think we have got a very clear idea about the potential of, uh, of this model uh, uh, for sport for development and for really solving one issue, which is the funding and resourcing issue. I have no time to comment further, and I'm very happy to move on to the next agenda item that actually well links with Liam's last point. The involvement of development banks in sport for development. I'm very happy to hand over to uh, Nelson Kamara, who is the head of sport impact that provides the secretary for the uh, development banks coalition for sustainable development through sport. Nelson, over to you. Thank you, Philip, and good morning and afternoon to all. Um, Nelson Kamara is the director of sport and banks based in Dakar, Senegal. Uh, not having in charge of the management of the sporting platform and also the secretary of the coalition for sustainable development for sport. Um, I'm really happy to moderate this session just after a highly remarks in which we have been able to, to easily understand that sport is not only a laser or just a passion for any competition, uh, but definitely a key tool uh, to be used for economic and social impacts. Uh, notably for access to sport for all, uh, combined with well designed, inclusive, sustainable infrastructures and relevant capacity building. And in the current sanitary and global environment, if we want to keep uh, 
a minimum of social cohesion. If we want to improve education and maintain children at school, um, if we want to emancipate, to bring more inclusion and to create sustainable jobs and of course to improve health conditions, we need to be innovative and to develop concrete solutions. And sport, I think, is definitely one of them. And the first good news is that we have no concrete tools, financial instruments, and methodologies easily replicable around sport for development, such as the SOC investment model we were just talking about, and also the SDGs indicators that we will touch during the next session. Another good news is that there is a momentum. Uh, more and more stakeholders from governments and to private institutions are convinced about this vision of sport as a key tool to rebuild. Among them, public development banks are notably more and more involved directly on site in partnership with local organizations. For just some quick examples, the German corporation has done a fantastic job over the last decade under the leadership of JIZ by designing and implementing sport for development programs in almost 40 countries in coordination with local health partners. JICA is doing the same, notably for the JICON. The key component as its, of its social strategy with new initiatives such as the Sporting Common Digital Platform, connecting fund providers with project managers in Africa, but also with new programs led in partnership with international sports organizations such as FIFA. Uh, Paris 2024 uh, organizing committee, or more recently the Basketball Africa League. But let's now go into more concrete facts. We have three panelists uh, here for this session. Um, Shruti Mehta, postgraduate researcher from the Monster Technological, Technological sorry, University. Erika Gabriela Sheko, our operations senior analyst at the Inter-American Development Bank. And Matthew Valo from the Sport for Development Department of the French Development Agency. Um, I will start with Shruti, uh, a former member staff of the Asian Development Bank, uh, involved in several research works on sport for development. Shruti, could you please give us just your insights regarding the dynamics of investment for development banks into the sport for development ecosystem? Yes, definitely, Nelson. Thank you so much. I'll make that really quick. And I just have one uh, slide to show along with what I have to share. But everything that we have been sharing is really relevant. And my research primarily focuses on the opportunities and challenges for multilateral development banks to invest in sport-based uh, solutions to achieve the SDGs, supported by MTU and the UNESCO chair and SEED. Uh, so the question that usually asked is that sport civil society or ministries of sport do not approach development banks to tap into funds and resources to fund and scale sport for development initiatives. And we keep wondering why, because it seems like development banks have willingness, potential appetite to really invest in sport. And there seems to be now growing evidence and data as well. So on a lot of, I've post a lot of uh, intensive data analytics, speaking to experts in the field, initial insights are that while development banks have invested in sports across sectors, there isn't any systematic and scalable business model that all of them uniformly follow. That sometimes even if there is investment in sport, the reporting is poor. An example is that EBRD invested in its first green fitness center in Tajikistan, but that project was positioned more as an energy project than the benefits it would do to sport. And also that a lot of the sport initiatives are characterized uh, in terms of only support to civil society in terms of grants. They haven't really been identified as effective business models. But what we can dispel through this research is that investments by in sport are made by development banks with a maximum proportion as we have noticed over the past 10 years to the education sector. And that if we want to leverage these existing investments, there is great scope. And this research will provide some kind of a repository of information through a website on the investments that development banks have made and whether they've been directly related to sport or not, who the network of champions are across these banks and uh, the advocacies that we might be able to build using this work. Moreover, we can use a lot of this data to inform or build a case for investments in active cities, uh, intentionally and scalable national policy initiatives, and maybe even infrastructure to hit, uh, host major sporting events. To go back to the social outcome contracting piece, it's so important that this might 
moving forward form as a very important model that MDBs could adopt and could in fact form a coercive and concentrated effort to implement across all the banks. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ruti, for, for, for your introduction, confirming the rationale and, and momentum of more in, involvement from PDBs in sport for development. Um, I will now ask Erika Gabriela Shekola from the Inter-American Development Bank, maybe to present some actions led by the bank in the field of uh, sport for development. Absolutely. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, it's fine. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nelson. Um, thanks to my partners at UNESCO for the invitation and for the organizers. This has been a wonderful session so far. So I'm Erica. I work on partnerships and sports for development at the IDB. And our organization is really driven by this agenda, Vision 2025, Reinvest in the Americas. It's a five pillar strategy for driving growth and recovery in Latin America and the Caribbean. And the agenda really emphasizes partnerships. It recognizes that no organization operating alone can effectively drive growth in the current landscape. So with this in mind, we're building on previous work and pushing forward to really deepen partnerships in areas that we know can be catalytic for, for stimulating recovery in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. And we consider sports for development to be one such area. Uh, we've worked in sports for more than a decade, harnessing sports partnerships as proven tools for engaging children and youth and improving outcomes in areas like health and education. And, and we essentially use sports as a transversal instrument to advance progress in diverse sectors like gender, citizen security, urban development, labor markets, and even most recently migration. And over the years, we've managed to deliver this kind of sports programming to more than 90,000 beneficiaries in 18 countries. Uh, we, we try to always measure the results and impact of our partnerships and overwhelmingly the the results, are, the results are good. Uh, and I'll share a few of these partnership examples with, with you today. So the first one and perhaps our most flagship famous program on sports is called Aganar. This is a partnership that brings together diverse actors, including Nike, PepsiCo, the US Agency for International Development and the Carlos Slim Foundation. And Aganar was designed to help at-risk youth find jobs, learn entrepreneurial skills and rejoin the education system. It's a seven to nine month program that helps these young people complete sports-based employability or life skills trainings, vocational technical trainings, internships, and job placement activities. And through the program, we've managed to reach thousands and thousands of beneficiaries in Argentina, Barbados, Brazil, and many other countries. And we've realized that the model is very effective in urban, semi-urban, and rural areas, and can also be adapted to serve participants with disabilities. More than 70% of the participants that have gone through Aganad have graduated from the program, and 65% of these managed to secure formal employment, return to school, or start a business within one year. So we're thrilled from, by, by this evidence. A second example that I would like to highlight is called Sportik. This is an ongoing regional partnership that we lead through our innovation laboratory, IDB Lab, in collaboration with the International Olympic Committee, Fundacion CIS and other partners operating in Argentina, Ecuador, and Colombia. The project uses a sports-based methodology and digital training to help youth build skills, to close gender gaps in technology and sports, and to teach Olympic values like excellence and respect. Uh, thus far, the program has convened nearly 60 partners that are part of its network, including schools and community organizations. And to date, we've managed to reach more than 8,000 young people, 56% of which are girls. Uh, we've trained more than 600 educators, and importantly, we've successfully adapted the model to the challenges of COVID-19. We've delivered innovative virtual programming, including a virtual regional marathon, a virtual campus offering, different activities, and, and other such efforts. And we've noted that young people who have already begin, uh, been able to complete the, the program have shown demonstrable improvements in their abilities to collaborate, to learn virtually, and to strengthen 21st century skills in the digital and life skills realm. And just to close briefly, I'm gonna move away slightly from sports to a model that is actually in the health sector, but that we think is really valuable and offers valuable insights for how we can structure sports and other development programs. This is the Salud Mesoamerica Initiative or SMI. It's a partnership led by the IDB with the Gates Foundation, the Slim Foundation, 
the governments of Mesoamerica and the governments of Canada and Spain, which were donors in this initiative. And for nearly a decade, SMI has been driving measurable improvements in maternal and infant health using a very innovative results-based financing model that basically incentivizes progress and shares the costs and risks of funding the program between countries and donors. Essentially, when countries achieve 80% of pre-established targets that are determined by the partnership in advance, they receive a cash incentive that's equal to 50% of the contribution they themselves put into the program. And the results have really been remarkable. Across Mesoamerica, we've managed to reach uh, more than 1.8 million women and children. We've managed to validate the effectiveness of this results-based financing model, which we consider can be replicated to other sectors and countries. Across all nations, we've noted major improvements, uh, including a nine per, an, an increase of nine percentage points in the quality of care for women with obstetric complications. And at the country level, improvements in the coverage and quality of care have reduced the health equity gap to the extent that health care for the poor is now closer to and sometimes above regional averages. I share this example because it is a proven and innovative new way of working that we think can really amplify the impact of our work in sports and beyond. Um, and we, we hope it can inspire us all to think outside the box as we design these types of programs. Thank you so much again for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erika, for this highly relevant insights. Um, of course, if there, if there is any question from the audience, we will take them at the end of uh, all sessions. Um, I will now ask Mathieu Valo to comment. Mathieu, uh, you are a staff member of the Sport for Development Department at the French Development Agency. Could you please give us more details about AFD experiences and strategy within the Sport for Development ecosystem? Thank you, Nelson. Um... Good morning, good afternoon to all, uh, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen. So my name is Mathieu, Mathieu Valo, uh, Sport and Development Project Officer at EFD of France. Uh, really, it's, it's great uh, for me to be part of this, of this panel um, about development banks' engagement in sport for development. So, so why, why EFD decided to invest in sport for development? Maybe, maybe to be very quick, uh, is due to three main reasons. First, the 2030 agenda for sustainable development goals um, highlights sport as a important uh, inclusive uh, vehicle. And we know, I won't say again, it contributes directly to the achievement of 12 SDGs and indirectly to all 17. After, as you might know, we have a, a, an important uh, sport event calendar we had in France the 2019 FIFA Women's World Cup. Uh, in September 2017, um, has been uh, the Olympic and Paralympic Games of Paris 2024 uh, has been designated. And two months after, uh, France uh, designated to host the Rugby World Cup in 2023. So this is huge. And last but not least, the first Youth Olympic Games to take place in Africa um, was supposed to happen in 2022 and postponed to 2026. And finally, a strong political support from our uh, French Republic president, uh, Emmanuel Macron, um, four years ago in Burkina Faso in his famous speech in Ouagadougou, or he really said that sport as a strong driver for action for youth and economic and social development. So. This, with this free reason, uh, we, we, we EFD board adopted a sport and development strategy in February 2019. So, well, it's always hard to talk about uh, after Erika from IDB or, or compared to GIZ with Suzanne in the room. Um, but <clears throat> basically, the aim of this strategy is to <clears throat> reinforce the group, EFD group commitment uh, to 100% social link. And, and really to foster sport for all. You, you understood is we use sport uh, as a tool for development and, and uh, facilitating equal access to sporting activities and uh, promoting gender equality. So how we want to achieve this? We have three pillars in our strategy. First is to launch new initiative by building partnership with sport leader organization, as explained by Nelson in an introduction. 
we have this uh, partnership with FIFA, with the NBA, and um, with Paris 2024 Organizing Committee. Also, launching new initiative with the digital platform Sport en Commun. I will put the link on the chat. Uh, please go, go to see this fantastic digital platform. Uh, the second big pillar is to integrate sport component in all EFD projects, means we do sport and health project, sport and education project, sport and urban development project, etc. And last but not least, um, to produce and capitalize on knowledge uh, in the sports sector by, by launching specific studies. Maybe you saw in the social network lastly, we, we had a fantastic uh, sport and gender uh, research study um, for, for with concrete action plan in five countries in Africa. Uh, I will also add in the chat the link of our, our activity report 2019-2020, uh, but just to emphasize that EFD committed more than 48 million euros in this sector for these two years. So, so this is great, but we can do more. Uh, maybe I will go back and, uh, uh, about the genesis of the Coalition Sustainable Development for Sport, if you don't mind, Nelson. Uh, as explained by my dear friend Katsumata-san from JICA of Japan in his opening remarks, we launched this coalition at the first Financing Common Summit in November 2020. And uh, this came from the necessary connection to connect uh, connection between sport and development finance world to have more impact. And therefore, uh, as you know, we have this partnership with Paris, Paris 2024 since uh, February 2020. And Paris and EFD engage other stakeholders, PDBs, international sport organization, and international organization to connect sport and development uh, worlds. So it means to put more sport in development and to, pu to put more development in sports. So as you understood, we have a coalition, a global multi-stakeholder coalition, gathering some PDBs, but also sport leading with the support of sport leading organization. So Paris 2024, of course, but also IOC, IPC, and uh, international organization like um, GIZ and UNESCO. Um, so, and to be very concrete, after one year, one year and two months of existence, what we want to try to achieve is to invest together in sustainable sport infrastructure and development projects. So the main objective is to identify a pipeline of sport infra projects according to agreed criteria, uh, green investment, sustainability, accessibility, it's really important that it's, these venues uh, are ac accessible to all, but through public-private partnership. And I'm speaking specifically to government officials who are attending this session. The coalition and its partners is available with the financial tools and technical expertise to assist to build this sustainable sport infra and development project for sports. And secondly, and it was very technical, it was great. Uh, as explained in the last session, uh, the coalition will focus in implementing pilot projects using social outcome contracting model to mobilize both public authorities and also the private sector. And this, we really believe, and WEFRA presentation was great, this fantastic innovative tool based on outcome and not on input, which is great. And speaking again to government official uh, attending today, we really believe that that is a fantastic opportunity for cost saving and quick impact we could see in the presentation and a great opportunity to legislate on sport and development public policies at the national level. And to end, sorry Nelson, I think we go back to the SDG 17, we need to work better together in stronger collaboration. So I'm calling again all the PDBs interested to join the coalition 
to, to join the coalition, to join the forces, to have more impact. And I will finish with my motto, our motto with Paris 2024, more sports, more impact. Thank you, Nelson. And thank you again to UNESCO and to the Irish Pavilion to, to give the floor to AFD. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Mathieu. Thank you very kind for all, all your inputs. Uh, you have seen, we have just had a set of concrete initiatives performed by PDBs in coordination with local organizations and government. This is why this coalition uh, presented earlier by Mr. Katsumata and Mathieu Valo has been created to combine financial resources, investment and share expertise, and also to better understand together key metrics, dynamics, methodologies, financial and social returns. As Mathieu just said, new joiners are definitely more than welcome to pursue and achieve together common objectives in close coordination with governments and local organizations. I will now pass the floor to Philip and Len Robinson from the Commonwealth for another highly relevant session related to SDGs and indicators and impact measurement of sport. Thank you very much for you. Thank you so much, and Nelson, and all the panelists. Again, giving a flavor of we are embarking on an innovation journey, and development banks are part of that journey already, and many others are expected to join. Uh, no time for, for further uh, introductions or comments. Very happy to have Lane Robinson from the Commonwealth Secretariat to moderate the next session. And I just one piece of introduction from myself. The Commonwealth has been doing pioneering work in the measurement of the impact of sport on the SDGs. And they are therefore extremely well placed to complement the financial or investors perspective we have heard so far with a perspective from the development community when it comes to the relevance of sport uh, impacting the SDGs. Lane, over to you. Thank you very much, um, Philip. And thank you very much to the Irish government. Thank you very much for you, UNESCO for this opportunity to share a little bit on some of the work we have been doing. My role is really to present um, it, the person who I think will give you a good overview of what's going on here in the person of Mr. Alan Zimmerman from Canada, who is the chair of our sport and SDG steering group and a member of the Commonwealth Advisory Body on Sport. Um, in this session, we'll be talking a little bit about how do we integrate all of these things we have heard on the, the development of indicator side with what we need to do on the investment side. And so without any further ado, allow me to turn you over to Alan, who will then say a few remarks and take us through the session. Over to you, Alan. Well, thank you very much, Lane. And uh, good morning. Well, good morning from Ottawa. A very cold morning today. Um, uh, very happy to, to, to be here to talk a little bit about what we've been doing uh, on our work in developing a framework and measuring uh, instrument for um, uh, measuring the impact of SDGs on, uh, on, on, on sport. Um, since April 2018, there has been a collaborative international project uh, to develop, test, and validate a measurement framework and model indicators to support member countries, sporting bodies, and other stakeholders to measure, evaluate, and enhance the contribution of sport and physical education and physical activity to prioritize sustainable development goals and targets. With the development stage of the indicator framework now complete, we've moved on to the implementation phase with a view to embed the indicators as part of policy instruments across, common, across the Commonwealth and make direct links towards the drive for clear data and investment in the sports sector. Today's session um, serves as uh, evidence of progress of measurement and very much complements the earlier discussions by UEFA and UNESCO on the SROI model and the SOC instruments on the need to strengthen uh, investment in the sector. Our two case studies that will be presented in just a moment uh, by Namibia and the ASEAN Secretariat will collectively showcase why measuring the contribution of sport matters through a national and regional lens. We suspect that the lessons learned from their proactive uh, approach to measurement will be informative for those new to the uh, indicators and invaluable in strengthening the call for greater investment in sports uh, for development and peace sector. Um, I'd now like to uh, welcome Roger Kambatuku, Senior Sport Officer of the Ministry of Sport, Youth and National Service of Namibia and Dr. Jeffrey St. Bernard, lead consultant on the Sport Development Index to speak on Namibia's behalf. 
after which uh, Dr. Roger Yap Chow Jr., uh, the head of education, youth and sport division of the ASEAN secretary will give his presentation on the ASEAN sports uh, cooperation. So thank you very much. And Roger, I turn it over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alan. Um, thank you very much, Lane. Thank you very much um, to UNESCO and the Commonwealth for granting us the opportunity to share our case study or the journey that we've traveled with the Commonwealth regarding the development of the Namibia Development, Namibia Sport Development Index. Um, uh, maybe from the start, um, I would just want to wish or to express Namibia's gratitude of having been afforded the opportunity and also to, to extend um, a word of compliments to all the participating countries, agencies, organizations, banks, and, and all other institutions. The, the, in Namibia, it was, it, for us, it has been a very important um, concept in terms of um, us, in terms of, I, I, hope, everyone, I hope my screen is, is visible to all the participants. Not seeing the screen, but continue anyway. Can you share, can you see my screen? Not seeing the screen, but you can continue speaking while I try to start. Oh, okay. Um, as I said, as I said that in Namibia around 2014, 2015, and maybe for lack of a better word, we tried to put the cart, the cart before the horses, where we we outlined in terms of our national development plan which is part of the bigger National Development Plan 20, Mission 2030. And as part of NDP5, which we set ourselves a target of increasing the contribution of setting a target of increasing the contribution of, 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 of uh, the, the employment status of people who are employed in the sports sector from 0% to 2%. Once, when, when we set that target, shortly we realized that I think we cannot, we cannot set a target of say that this is the contribution of sports that we want to contribute to the national agenda or national target without having reliable and continuous statistical data to back up our case in terms of saying that this is what sports can do. And that is why we, together with the Commonwealth, we set up on this journey of developing what we call the Namibia Sports Development Index to make a case for sports to say that what is it that sports can contribute? And by an extension, what the contribution of sports to social development will be, social economic development, and by and large, to the sustainable development goals as they are enunciated by the United Nations and so on. So that has been our journey. So the government is, is, has been part of this journey with the Commonwealth through the consultant that we've been able to, 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 to be given at our, at our disposal. And Developing the NSDA was so important to us, and why was it important? Because now, suddenly, it was it was an, a, a tool that we can use to have information or evidence on the status of sports in the country. How do we profitalize sports in the country, and how do we contribute to youth development? How do we contribute to social development? How do we go, how do we contribute to economic growth and, 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 and employment? It was also very important because the index then will highlight will, will, will put us in a position to highlight those areas where perhaps some of our policies need the review or better understanding so that we can the policies can be then aligned to the national agenda or the national targets. The index was also very important because very important now the index will provide us with an evidence-based recommendations to say, based on the data that we've been able to collect, this is what we need, this is where we are, and this is where what, we, what, what the picture is, the national picture is, and this is what we can do as a country. The index was also very important for us because it, 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 recommend, it recommended realistic steps for what, that we can disseminate now for say to government policymakers, National Planning Commission, Ministry of Finance, uh, Office of the President. Certainly now as a sports industry, we can go back, we, we could go to them and say, this is what we've been able to find. In a case before or, or the, the, in the previous dispensation where we do not have an index, we, we, we will normally go at meetings and make the case for sports, but then people could not understand what is it that you are saying? What, how is the industry affected? How many people are you employing? How many dis disabled persons are doing sports? How many women are involved in sports? How many uh, children are playing sports? How, what is the level of effectiveness? So all these things, we could not, we could not 
clearly enunciate and we could not clearly defend them as a sector because we did not have reliable data. So the NSDI was a, was a way of us getting reliable data that we can use in our efforts of making a case for sports or in our efforts of getting to an evidence-based approach to say that this is what the sector needs. If Namibia, for example, we want to profit less, this is what we will need. This is what we have. This is what we'll, this, is, this, this will be what we need to do. So this is why the, the index for us was important as a country because it, 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 it is positioning us, Namibia as a country now, to put us in a position where we can now start to lead, especially on the subcontinent, to be a leader in quantifying and enhancing the contribution of sports to socioeconomic development and use this status that we have now to, to, to enhance our domestic and international partnerships. Because in, in, in at the end of our slides, it, it will be very clear to say that, we, this is what we want to say that, at the end of the day, we also want to enhance partnerships because the, we, the work is not done. And we've got phase two, phase three, phase four of the project that we need to undertake in terms of getting to a place where we can continually, or the data collection process can become a continuous uh, process that will be reliable. So, um, and, and when we, our approach to, because when we, when we, when the data collection process, when we, when we, claimed, when we are trying to identify our indicators to use, we relied or namely, or we relied on, on, on our national documents. We've got a couple of documents that we relied on. We've got the Namibia National Sports Policy of 1993, which we are busy reviewing in any case. We've got the Vision 2030. The Vision 2030 is the national goal of the government of, of the country, but it is then broken down into uh, five yearly plans, uh, five yearly plans that, to, that, that, that we are using to, to get to 2030. We were busy with NDP 5 now. Uh, at the end of this year, we are transitioning into NDP 6. We, the other document that we relied on is the 20, 000, 2018 uh, a framework that which we call the Namibia Sports Professionalization Framework that we drew up as a country in terms of professionalizing sports. The concept of professionalization came about because of the target that is NDP5 of creating employment of 2%. Because we saw it as the only way that you can create employment through sports is if you make the industry professional. So that is hence that, 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 that the framework. And the other document that we relied on is the Harambe Prosperity Plan, which is a, which is a, which is a document uh, that is uh, championed by the Office of the President to accelerate the implementation of the Vision 2030. And then, then obviously the National Sports Act. So uh, those are the three policy initiatives that we, that, that in which, or which we used to house or to ground the indicators then that, will, that we use then in terms of developing the Namibia Sports Development Index. Uh, this is where now I invite Dr. Godfrey, I'm not sure whether he's on, to, to, to lead us in, 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 on, on, the, on the other slides of our presentations. Dr. Godfrey, uh, are we together? Yes, I am on board, and thank, thank you, you very much. much for that introduction, Roger. I'm really pleased to be part of this session. Thanks to the Commonwealth Secretariat, I'm pleased to be representing here in some way the government of Namibia, and thanks also to the organizers of the meeting. So to take off where Roger left, um, the, the plans and the policies that he referred to facilitated the generation of five main domains of the NSDI. They are domain one, economic development and employment opportunity, domain two, governance of the support sector and funding, domain three, social inclusion and equity, domain four, perceptions of sport and physical activity and social impact, and domain five, participation in sport and physical activity, which more or less covers health and well-being. And altogether, these domains uh, were associated with 25 indicators, but based on the work we had been doing, we were able to at least generate 10 indicators based on the data that were available. So where do the data come from? What data do we need? And certainly, we drew on existing data sources from the National Statistical Agency, the Ministry of Finance, um, the Ministry of Education and Culture, we also drew on data from the National Statistical Agency, of course, I mentioned it, and those data really related specifically to the labor force survey in Namibia, 
the population and housing um, census where data would be available. And we are talking about these data in so far as they are not only relevant in the context of what we um, use to facilitate data collection, but what will likely be used as well to collect data for other indicators that we were not able to um, collect. Of course, the National Statistical Agency would permit you know, um, data collection and national income accounts, which would be relevant for making statements about the contribution of sport to GDP and so on. And National Household Income and Expenditure Survey, which would contribute in some measure to the similar indicators. From the Ministry of Finance, it was important to get a sense of government spending on sport and there are estimates there that we drew on and the Ministry of Education, Arts and Culture, while they do collect valuable data, those data to some extent were lacking in, in, in its capacity to meet some of the needs of the NSDI. But basically um, the, the data sources that I allude to here were primarily important in facilitating the collection of data for domains one and domain number two. As we move on, we, we, we can think in terms of some new sources and in terms of those new sources, we developed some instruments for some new sources of data that would really facilitate the collection of data for domains two, domains three, domains four and domain five. And you can see the new sources of data collection that we advocated. In fact, a census of sport, recreational and allied entities in Namibia was conducted while we um, worked on this exercise, we targeted sporting bodies and associations, facilities, training institutions, among a number of other agencies. And of course, this was managed by the Ministry of Youth, Sport and National Service. Service, Of course, there was oversight from the NSA with respect to the data collection. And we are proposing that, you know, in the future that this is an exercise that could be, since I, I would like to think that what we did initially is a kind of pilot exercise, but it could be eventually refined and annualized to facilitate the collection of data annually. We also proffered a national survey of participation and perception, sport and recreational activities. And those indicators, those, that data collection exercise would more or less facilitate the collection of data for domains four and do, domains four and five. Um, they would also provide you know, input data for eight indicators um, that rely on, on, on data from, from that particular um, eight NSDI indicators. And of course, you know, this is an exercise that would take the form of a pre-designed survey instrument that is going to be completed largely among adults 15 years or older. And we think, you know, this is an exercise that can be done um, triennially. In terms of some of the initial data that we um, found, um, here are some pr preliminary um, data. The first line diagram gives us a sense of, you know, um, the expenditure by the Ministry of Sport, Youth and National um, Service, the sport budget um, in terms of how it, 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 it relates annually in terms of you know the overall budget in, and what what what's spent on sport um, in terms of the second um, graph what you really see is the um, data that I generated based on um, what were collected from the N Namibian government not only the Ministry of Sport Youth and National Service but other ministerial agencies that provide support to sport and sport development, recreational activities and so on. And you can see the general trends there. What is interesting, of course, is the one of the things we wanted to get at was, you know, what is the pr proportion of females in executive positions in sport organizations? And when compared with some of the countries in the South Pacific, the figures for Namibia seem pretty much consistent with about 34% of women in sport and, 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 and sporting activities in, um, in, in involved in executive positions, managing those, those kinds of activities. Next slide. Yeah, and as you go on, you can see some of the other indicators that we were able to provide estimates for. You can see the time series that looks at, you know, percent contribution 
of sport, physical education, and active recreation to GDP 2013 to 2020. And you can see some of the other indicators related primarily to um, domains two and, and, and domains four in particular. Moving on, we can ask ourselves, you know, in terms of some of the recommendations for, for going forward, certainly there's the 2022 population and housing census carded. And one of the critical items, of course, is also to um, get a sense of, you know, participation in sport, physical activity and recreation. Fortunately, I think Namibia already is on the ball in terms of, you know, inserting a question that would elicit that kind of data. Certainly, um, notwithstanding the enthusiasm in Namibia, um, the survey targeting the population of Namibia, um, that to, to me is a, is, a, is a critical requirement and the enthusiasm is there. And I think, you know, as I said, that survey can be conducted um, every three years. And it is something that I think once the monies are available, it can certainly be done by the ministry responsible for sport overseen by the National Statistical Agency and so on. So I think, you know, by and large, that takes care of my presentation. And I would move on now to ask Roger to continue and end up, wind up. The... Apologies, dear, dear colleagues. Thank you so much for, for this important perspective uh, and for sharing all these experiences. I have to be fair to all the panelists that are supposed to follow within now only a few minutes left, right? So I have to ask Lane, please bear with me to try and make it as short as possible. We have very important interventions planned for the next uh, agenda item and we are way beyond schedule. So we need, I call upon sportive fairness to all the next ones to allow the following ones to intervene as well. If we don't make it very short, uh, that will no longer possible. Lane, I count on your sportive solidarity sure, sure. here. So thank thank you. you very much. Mm -hmm. um, so we have sort of probably just shown the Namibian example. So I'm going to ask Roger just to give way to allow for a regional perspective to share um, so that we can hear what at a regional level, which is at the ASEAN level, we see how the same work is happening. But I think it was very useful to see that. So we, given what Philip has said, let me just press and ask our ASEAN colleague to just make a brief intervention now on what this looks like. Roger Chow Jr. on at a regional level. Thank you so much, Philip. Okay, um, I'm sharing my PowerPoint. Uh, can everyone see it? Not yet, it's coming up. Hello? It's not coming up yet. Okay, anyway. Um, in the meantime. Yes, it's coming yeah. now, we see it. First, first and foremost, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to thank UNESCO and the Irish Pavilion for organizing this and hosting the event. Uh, this is very important, uh, particularly focus on sports and um, <clears throat> sports and sustainable development and particularly the importance of getting numbers and measurements. Uh, I'll try to make it short, <clears throat> but uh, basically I'm the head for education, youth and sports at the ASEAN Secretariat. So I'm here to present to you a uh, regional perspective of what uh, the ASEAN Secretariat have been doing in relation to sports for development and the focus on um, developing measurements. Now, <clears throat> going, Oh, what's wrong? Maybe, uh, it was for us it has been a very important um, concept in terms can, of. Can you us. see the slide? Uh, yes, anyway. we can see. Continue quickly. Okay. Uh, now, the let's start. Um, in 2013, uh, the Vintian Declaration on Sports Cooperation in ASEAN particularly focused on the role of sports in realizing the vision of the ASEAN community, particularly in its role in forging a regional identity and building a caring and sharing community. Where we now, beyond the development of the ASEAN community, which was officially established in 2015, the post-2020 ASEAN Cooperation on Sports as the ASEAN Sports 2021, 2025, aligns the initiative with the development of the ASEAN Social Cultural Community Blueprint, and in particular, uh, in relation to sports, uh, the Kazan Action Plan. 
um, in particular, uh, the relationship between sports priorities with the SDGs. Interventions has been incorporated in relation um, which are regional and programmatic in nature. But the most important thing is the focus and the need to develop monitoring and evaluation frameworks to ensure that the initiatives programs uh, undertaken within ASEAN in the sports sector are actually measurable to show the progress and the tangible achievements that each of the activities and programs contribute, not only in terms to ASEAN community building, but also in relation to achieving the UN 2030 SDGs. As you can see, <clears throat> the alignment between the ASEAN com social community, a uh, social cultural community blueprint 2025 and the various declarations are the basis to develop the ASEAN work plan uh, on sports 2021-2025. In particular, ASEAN cooperation on sports also takes into consideration partnerships uh, with development partners, uh, such as the, the SOMS, uh, which is senior officers meeting in sports plus Japan priorities and eventually uh, initiatives in sports uh, with China as well. Um, that's happening. Um, in the coming year. Now, um, <clears throat> the focus uh, has been, sorry, the focus for 2021-2025 <clears throat> has been on sports for development and peace, which is priority one, um, <clears throat> promotion of a healthy lifestyle and particularly increasing um, sports participation and physical activities. <clears throat> Uh, professional capacity building, sports integrity, and sports science, promoting ASEAN awareness in through sports activities, sports tourism, and sports industry, and basically resource mobilization, partnership engagement, and develop and essentially uh, monitoring and evaluation for ASEAN cooperation in sports. <clears throat> if you actually look at the various activities plan uh, in the work plan. <clears throat> Priority one, which is basically sports contribution to development outcomes and peace, contributes roughly 29% of all the activities. <clears throat> now, on the other hand, uh, the priority number four, which is promoting ASEAN awareness, actually um, has 15% of all the activities. So the, the, <clears throat> these two figures alone represents about what uh, almost half of all the activities in the ASEAN work plan on sports. Basically, it focuses on sustainable development goals, but it also focuses on regional community building and the role of sports in terms of uh, con uh, the, the contribution of the sports sector within the ASEAN region um, should be seen both ways in terms of contribution to regional community building, contribution to uh, ASEAN awareness, ASEAN identity for um, uh, building, and basically strengthening the ASEAN community. But it should be seen as well in terms of its contribution to sustainable development goals. However, how do we measure that? And do we have the numbers and the data to measure it? <clears throat> now, <clears throat> ASEAN Secretariat has been collaborating with the Commonwealth Secretariat in particular, joining their activities, uh, including the series of the sports and sustainable development goals indicators, communities of practice, <clears throat> the various courses, um, sports for sustainable development, designing effective policies and programs. Take notice, it's not ASEAN Secretariat, it's also ASEAN member states. <clears throat> now, um, the ASEAN Secretariat and the Commonwealth Secretariat has also initiated the identification of alignment between the work plan and the sustainable development goals, including its alignment with the ASEAN Social Cultural Community Blueprint 2025 and the different potential indicators. Um, in fact, we will be having a meeting soon to further work on ways forward to further develop um, the alignment and essentially um, enhance the monitoring and evaluation framework. Now, one important uh, report that came out uh, late last year <clears throat> under the Singapore chairmanship on the sports sector was the first ASEAN sports participation survey, 
which can be considered a unique region-wide initiative leveraging on Porta's active citizenship worldwide program, which is focused on physical activity. <clears throat> um, this particular survey um, <clears throat> surveyed um, one city in each ASEAN member countries, each of the 10 ASEAN member countries, and it attempts to measure <clears throat> active participation, um, which was pegged at 65, uh, according to the survey, <clears throat> and its contribution to the economy. Um, based on the data um, analyzed and acquired by um, <clears throat> dur uh, during the survey, and <clears throat> it is estimated that um, physical active participation in sports <clears throat> contributes to roughly 3.3 billion US dollars to the entire region. The, another important aspect there is <clears throat> if um, there will be an increase from 65% to 80% physical participation <clears throat> in sports, that could actually add another 100 million US dollars <clears throat> um, to the region. So essentially, this is a very <clears throat> um, unique way of getting information that contributes and actually um, push for um, looking into the contribution of sports <clears throat> in the region, but this only the uh, economic and socioeconomic side. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> further to the ASEAN work, uh, work plan on sports, we also have partnerships with uh, development countries such as Japan. In particular, <clears throat> uh, the, we, in relation to SDG 17, uh, <clears throat> one of the speakers earlier was talking about SDG 17. We also learned from um, experiences and developments um, from Japan in terms of their hosting of the Tokyo 2020 Games. How they managed to do it in times of crisis, particularly the COVID-19 pandemic, <clears throat> and basically how they incorporated sustainable development goals and sustainability um, in hosting. Sorry for doing. interfering yes, in this yes. wonderful presentation. My, my sad uh, role is to interrupt people and this I need to do now. Okay. Because uh, we really need to move on to, give, to the next agenda okay. item. Give Thank me you. one minute to close. Uh, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> essentially, there are a lot of things that have been done, but the important thing there is uh, the ASEAN Secretariat has um, seen the importance and the need to get actual information, data, and how to measure uh, this data and to measure the initiatives and priorities of uh, the sports sector um, in the region and ASEAN member states to contribute to evidence-based policymaking and essentially enhance um, investments uh, both at the regional and the national levels to encourage um, investments in sports and um, produce more effective <clears throat> and um, initiatives in the sports sector. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you very much, um, everyone. So you have heard a little bit both from the national context about how the work is progressing, but of course it is still challenging, um, but we are making progress on how do we measure that the, the, the contribution sport is making to development outcomes. <clears throat> at both national and regional level. And I hope it will con continue and build and strengthen as we try to then help our member countries all across the world to do the same and embed this, this, this methodology into the way they think about sport and the national development context. Back to you, Philip. Thanks so much, Lane and uh, uh, colleagues uh, for again, showcasing the reality of measurement. This is not methodology, it's reality. And it's, uh, we start seeing how it changes the game. I'm moving on very quickly. I hear from Catherine and her team that we can go beyond the initial the planned duration te technology wise. I hope that all people in this virtual room and in Dubai can stay on for uh, for a more time than initially foreseen. So that is not a problem. And thanks for the host for making this possible. I move on now to Catherine Carty uh, and her team for the next agenda item. Catherine, you have the floor. 
Thank you, Philip, and thank you to everyone who has presented today online. I know it has been technically an intense enough session so far this afternoon, so I assure you we are coming to a close. We have an important agenda item to address first and an important discussion, and as, it, as Philip says, we will run into an opportunity. But following that, for those of you here present in the room, we do have a very nice reception afterwards and a more light-hearted entertainment. So we're on a last stretch in terms of the session, but a very important stretch, and I think something that came up earlier on in this morning's session that David Donoghue mentioned in terms of that link with human rights. So a lot of the work that the UNESCO chair has been leading in the past few years as we link, link with SDGs is making sure that even in the measurement and investment session um, and the data session that the link between data and the use of data to report on human rights is also a very, very important context and an important agenda, agenda as we move forward. One of the aspects of the international work that we've been driving at the UNESCO chair is trying to make sure that there's policy coherence in what we do. So as we reach out to governments and other stakeholders to suggest that they take a particular angle aligned with sustainable development goals, the global goals, that we look at how useful that approach is in other areas of operation of sport, including into investment, measurement, development. One thing that we've very consciously been doing in the UNESCO chair team with my colleagues Sarah, Gerard, Ashling, um, and others is to really look at how the human rights agenda fits and how the data and indicators that connects with sustainable development goals also can be used to report on the, the legal obligations that many states have to report on human rights. And sport, physical activity, play in many contexts is in that human rights context. So we have two um, case studies to present to you today. Both stakeholders are in the House and we're really appreciative of the efforts that Mauritius and Northern Ireland made to, to join us here in Dubai and delighted they could do it in the cur current context. So fantastic to hear from them. So I have Miss Sarah Rowett Karimji. Sarah is Senior Advisor to the Prime Minister on Sport in Mauritius, as well as being Chair of the Mauritian Sports Council and Active Mauritius. And we have the Director of Active Mar Mauritius, Dr. Dr. Baptiste, in the room also. So I'll firstly invite uh, Sarah Rao Karimji and Dr. Baptiste to present on the work that they have been doing in Mauritius. Uh, very innovative work um, and very well worth hearing from them in terms of what they've been doing. And David mentioned earlier on in terms of Global North, Global South, and I think here we have an example of how Global South has many lessons that we can learn uh, from in other parts of the world, so delighted to have you here in the room. We'll then hear from Michael Boyd from the Northern Irish Human Rights Commission on the work that as a Human Rights Commission has been taken on board and embraced very positively in the domain of sport, and again, for human rights institutions across the world, the opportunity to look at really investing in how sport can be that contributor to human rights is something that Michael is going to address. I'm not going to talk any longer, so we have 10 minutes from each group here. Then we're back over to discussion, and as I mentioned, we have a very nice reception, so uh, I encourage you to enjoy these sessions from Sarah Rao Karimji and, and Michael Boyd and Dr. Baptiste. Over to you. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you, everybody. I'm sure you're all a bit tired. I don't know whether you want to move a bit. After all, we're all talking about physical activity here, and I think we've all been sitting down. So maybe stand up and then stand up just a few minutes. Yeah. Get that oxygen going back again. Stretch a bit. I think we, we're all... That's great if you want. Yeah, I don't know whether we're on... Yeah, and water. And just move around a little bit, guys, and then I'll invite you all to sit down again. Thanks, Catherine. Great. Yeah, a bit of stretching there. Yeah, very good. <laughs> Okay, as we all know, um, yeah, so I, I won't be as long, I will try not to be very long, and um, quite difficult to follow after seeing so many great presentations from all these different countries, so where I'm going to do my best here with Dr. Batis, first of all, I would like also to thank um, the Irish government for inviting us, um, Catherine for all the work she does at the UNESCO, and all of you being present here, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to tell the story of what we've been doing in Mauritius, more like a storytelling, and to see where we're at. So um, I myself became the chairperson of the Mauritius Sports Council in 2015, and just to um, give you a little bit of a background information, initially prior to, um, to, to um, 2015, there was very little, if not no funding, in any sports-related um, um, funding such as for sports for all or sports for development or as it was termed sports for all and it was a once-off activity. 
So one of the first things I did during my first year of my tenure was to actually start th three programs. One of the first ones was an after-school sports and fitness programs for basically on a pilot project. There was no government funding for that, so I had to work with the private sector and some partners. And then introduce a bit of swimming in the school curriculum. And thirdly, work with a group of vulnerable children that was actually in our um, juvenile um, situation and bring them to meet the athletes. And I, at that time, that was the only way I could really um, start the whole interest in sports for development by doing some pilot work and actually showcase afterwards. It would have been very difficult to go to the government at that stage and say, we need funds for that. It wasn't really going to work. We had absolutely no data to show this. And now it's great to see the amount of work and the amount of research behind that will actually now really back up everything that we've all been doing. So based on that, um, 2015 started. and. It started getting some attention, and the government started getting interested. People were saying, oh, what's that? This is different. Um, normally, we do a lot of sports. All the funding in Mauritius went to high level, which is still very important. So after a couple of years of working with that, and I must thank quite a few sponsors. At the time, we called them sponsors. It sounds better to say social investors right now. I think that's a better term that we can use, because they were coming in really to support all the sports for development and a bit of persuasion on, on my part and a few other friends. So by the time that started, but quickly I got the attention of the government and the Prime Minister. As Catherine mentioned, I am senior advisor in the Prime Minister's office on matters relating to physical activity and pushing that agenda and bringing this new way of thinking. And one of the first things I remember having to tell everybody when you are going to talk about sports, do stop saying that we'll, do, we'll do, take part in sport to become the next swimmer or the next um, major athlete because you should just be doing sports. That concept slowly but surely started working. Of course, eventually, if you get an athlete, that's very good as well. But the whole point was you do sports for the sake of doing it. It's a human rights approach. It's a child-based approach, the right to movement. So I was talking like that, and people were kind of saying, well, what is she on about, really? Like, you know, we've been doing sports. We need to get the swimmers. We need to get the athletes. But I think it resonated with a lot of people. And eventually, people started saying, yeah, there, there's a story there, and I can see that. So the, one of the first things that then slowly but surely got the attention was swimming. So I'm going to use swimming as a case study, because I come from a point of view of having very little data, but just a lot of persuasion capacity. And one of the first pilot we did was actually um, to start swimming in the schools. But when I got to a certain stage, I had to also then come up and do some more fundamental work. So I was lucky then around 2017, 2018, the Commonwealth was in Mauritius. They came and started this whole language behind what we were doing. Then after that, we started with the, with the policy. We got a policy going, a national sports and physical activity policy, which was never the case in Mauritius. This is the first one. And this was launched by the prime minister himself, which, again, associating at the highest level of the government um, to this project actually gave it all the impetus. We example, for one of the first things we did to get it going, we, we, we did a 12-hour um, a nonstop run where we got the whole cabinet to come running. And it was quite incredible to see for one hour our whole cabinet running, walking, not running, actually walking. But that is where people said, oh, this is different. What's this about like? So it only took us two or three years of a little bit of marketing and then following it up quickly with the policy. Then the Mauritius Sports Council was given the mandate to actually launch Active Mauritius. This is why we're all branded at the moment, Active Mauritius, everyone, everywhere. As you see, it's also our SDGs, it's for everyone. So we hope throughout the whole program of the 35 actions to 35% of the population active is, it englobes all the, um, as much as we can, many of the SDGs that we've talked about. All this is very new to Mauritius, so I'm, don't, I'm not as fluent as some of you in the language of SDGs and human rights attached to the program, but we've been coached, we've been supported by Commonwealth, by Catherine, her team, so I think we're getting there. We're adding these two together, and I think eventually we'll have a very good um, program for the Global South. And um, based on the 35%, the 35% is quite sad, actually, because we are only 12% of the population physically active. So, but it's okay, it's a start. So, and actually, and the 12% is 12% according to WHO um, requirements to be physically active and to get a gain on physical health. We have about another 12% that's active once a week, the, the football players, the people that go for a very slow walk, but they're about another 12%. So we have literally a very, very physically inactive, and I would also say sadly physically 
uneducated population in Mauritius due to a lot of things. Now, it's in the, lots of things have been done as well. We've reformed the, the education system as well. Physical education is there, and so on and so on. I won't dwell too long on that, so the next slide. So that's very quickly we'll be going, oops, I've disappeared. No, I'm back again. So we're trying to raise to 35%. And some people said to me, uh, even when we put this in the, in the new manifesto, going from 14 to 35 is a, is a big jump. But I think it, we have to go somewhere. I mean, 14% is low. So how do we do this? Next. Next slide. Yes, we have, this is the policy. Sorry, that's the other one is better. The policy is about that. We, we blo uh, broke it down in three sections, which is it's well written. And we have the foster a culture of community and sports and physical activity. That's what the Mauritius Sports Council is busy doing. We're trying to go through all that. Create an amata to elite sport environment. That's already there. That was already part there. We're just tidying that up. And certainly what we've all been talking about is to grow a sport economy. Is to show effectively. I won't go on that because somebody else, tw two or three of the um, presentations did that very well. The reason for investment in sports, um, the um, return of investment, I think we're all very familiar with that. Next. So, yeah, so then to get all these people active, it was very difficult after me doing the three uh, pilot, which was working really well, and I, was, I needed then to tidy up my show and get it. Where do I go from there? Because we're talking that to actually get everybody activated and to sustain participation. So we did it in four headings, and then we have also the operating model, the data, and inside the funding model implementation plan. This is just different programs we do. So it goes from five to 95, and again, this is very new to Mauritius. We didn't have this approach. And now all our funding is again going against that. And I've got, I, I strongly believe, the commitment of the government to reach the 35% because I've seen the funding increase. So now if I go on the funding, based on that and the reaction of the people, just be, and I didn't have much data, but one data that I, I did have was swimming. And I take that as a study case that even sometimes if you don't have all the official data ready, I was able to go there and give them a statistic that actually goes, grew, went straight to the heart of the government. We brought 2,000 kids swimming on our pilot project. And now you all know, I think there's a slide of Mauritius there. Can you just show me on the island? No. No, yeah, next one, there. I'll just take that as an example of, of funding and the reaction, and then from zero to actually being fully funded. We saw, this is Mauritius, it's a coastline. You can already swim all around the island, bar a few places. We have enough swimming pools, be public and private. When we did the first pilot of 2,000 children learning how to swim, we only had 25 kids that could swim 25 meter unaided in deep water. I mean, it, it, it is, it most, and I think most countries in the global south would be this case. Vietnam, Malaysia, lots of them talk about swimming as well. It's just not being part of the Mauritian culture to learn how to swim. But based on that, after doing that, and just doing, giving that statistics to the Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance, this was announced in the budget. That this, and this simple statistics was enough to get it going, and the next thing, and so four years fast forward, we have a fully funded program for swimming. Now, swimming is part of the national curriculum. I was able to go from 20 schools to 35 schools to 10 sessions for 200 schools. And in the last budget, it was announced that this is fully funded. We are going to now have 21 million rupees. I'll give you the figure for you to understand how without a lot of um, official data, but just that simple baseline telling people in the government that it will actually only cost the government 50 euros per head for a child to learn how to swim. I mean, how can I not convince somebody when I say that, that, you know, if you want to save somebody's life, and then, of course, then I would have used a lot of the, the importance of learning to swim. Because when you learn to swim as well, and then we, we obviously you're on an island, this is a, a, a right of a child, I strongly believe, if you're on a, living on an island, and at any point, I'll walk to there, if you're start at any point, the furthest away you are from any sea in Mauritius is about a 30-meter drive, 30-minute drive. So it's the most... Accessible sport, the most democratic sport, is the most, uh, it's just, it's available. It's cheap, a swimsuit, a goggle, off you go. You take the bus, it's, all our, our seas are, are well protected. We have bathing areas, so it's there waiting for the population. And we have about 1.2 million tourists coming to Mauritius every year, bar COVID, of course. But they see all these tourists coming to use their natural resources. And I think that's what happens to a lot of countries like that there. Other people are coming to use their natural resources. And of course, they're more than, more than welcome. But it's very sad for me, who swims regularly in Mauritius, not to see my fellow citizens swimming as well. And if you ask a Mauritian, 
do you swim? They say, yes. And you say, if I were to throw you in the deep end, can you swim? They go, no, no, this is not swimming. This is that competitive swimming. So, but it's getting there. So now we've got the buy-in with the Ministry of Education. So every single child in Mauritius will get 40 sessions of swimming before they leave their primary school. So we're guaranteeing nearly a whole next generation that can swim. So I did a simple math just sitting there a few minutes ago without having any big um, financial background. That if a child learns how to swim, if I have about 9,000 kids leaving the system now to swim, 9,000 children will go and buy a swimsuit, 9,000 children will go and buy a goggle, a swimming cap, 9,000 kids will encourage their parents to swim. Within a year, we'll, I would have doubled the amount of investment that I would, I would have put in learning how to swim. And if a child can swim, of course the child might want to go and paddle. A child might want to go and do some non-motorized swimming sports, which we're also uh, promoting on, on the island. So just swimming in itself is a localized activity. And I think that's what we have to look at as well. What can your country offer that's local, that's not expensive, that can be easy accessible? So that was our story with swimming. And of course, at the basis of this is save your life. It is so sad that if a child falls in water in Mauritius, they only have like a minute or two to be saved, or as, and we do have a higher rate of drowning. So through this, we're able to show all the data, but especially by just keeping our data from swimmers to non-swimmers, showing the figures, and then going to the Minister of Finance saying, why can't you invest 50 euros in every child how to learn how to swim? It was never the quick, it was so quick that they said, this is, yes, this is the, before the, it was such a big amount of money initially to them, but when it came down to this per child, Saving a child's life, meaning investing 50 euros, I, was, I got the buy-in of the whole government. So I will, this is a bit of the story. I mean, I, I could go on. I think we're all a bit tired, so I won't go on too, too long as well. But I'd like Dr. Bastis now to come up and explain to you, still using swimming, how we use swimming in a group of very difficult children. It would resonate a bit with what we've heard from the football and so on. How we use swimming to do exactly the same work in, in a community where it was very difficult and where swimming was the activity, but behind that was all our SDGs, our human rights. So I'll let Dr. Bastis come up and explain that because it's a wonderful piece of work himself and his team had done. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sarah. So just like Sarah said, uh, in December 2020, we had a, I would say, marvelous experience just like with boxing. Uh, back in Mauritius, we have a, I would say, dangerous area called Black Barkley, which is much around there. And it's just, it just surround one hour of our biggest swimming pool, Serge Alfred swimming pool. So this swimming pool is known for all kind of uh, mischievous behaviors of uh, kids all around. So we've noticed that the only thing that makes them act so bad is just that they don't have access to the swimming pool. Uh, it will sound very bad and say it's all those I would say high class people coming up, private school who get access to the pool, whereas the local community doesn't have access to, to that pool. So through the 2019-2020 budget, we had a project called LAMPS, Local Active Mauritius Partnerships. So basically LAMPS, we work the other way around, not top bottom, we come from the community and we go up. So, Local Active Mauritius Partnership works on what we like to say, I think someone mentioned this earlier, we work on five Ps. People, places, promotion, partnership, and uh, program. So we have a program, there are the people there, we have a place, we don't have a partnership nor the promotion. So just those two peas missing was creating chaos. They were throwing rocks in the pool. On su Sundays, they were running on the roof of the pool and then jumping, jumping into the pool. It's just big chaos. So what we did, we went into the local community, meet with all those force vive or NGOs dwelling within the community. We went to see the uh, relig religious bodies. So what they did, Yeah, so what they did, so the, 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 the priest announced during uh, mass that the pool is open for you guys. And just within three days of, I would say, active promotion, 
and partnering with the local uh, NGOs, we were able on six days to get 508 kids to come to the pool, enjoy swimming. We didn't want them to learn how to swim. We just wanted them to dwell within the pool. So people were saying, oh, you have drug dealers within those kids. But we had no, at any moment, we didn't have any issue with them. They, it was totally the contrary. They, were, they felt valued. For the first time, we offered them, with all our confidence, the pool was theirs. They could do what of, of a, not whatever they wanted. But from this experience, for the next, I think, four months, we had no trouble at the pool. But then it started again because we couldn't sustain because COVID came. But this program, we are replicating it in all our different communities. And I think this local active motion partnership, the LAMPS approach, is something that's really going to bring in uh, the participation rate, but also our return on investment. Because 508 kids enjoying physical activity would be maybe just nine going into the correctional unit, correctional uh, youth center compared to 300 over 300 going in. So thank you for, for your attention. Thank you both so much for that example from Mauritius. I think it's very tangible, very concrete, and very transferable to other countries. Um, there's lots of messages there, especially for small island states and any state with a coastline. I think a very, very valid example and of how you mobilize the government attention on it so clearly and so quickly. So uh, compliments to that example. It was absolutely fantastic. And I'm sure there are many other uh, countries who will take the lead from that. And you know, uh, in many ways, um, I, I guess a, a low tech but really meaningful in terms of the impact on people's lives and into the human rights, especially rights of the child and, and many other areas leading into even the blue economy and, and work and employment on the water. So we're now going to lead to our last speaker of the day before we head into the discussion section and our nice reception, which is awaiting you outside. So I have Michael Boyd joining us from the National Human Rights Commission, or the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. Um, and I'd just like to say the, the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission funded a project with us, the UNESCO chair earlier this year in the domain of sport. And we worked quite a lot with Northern Ireland as well through that project and very delighted to do so. Northern Ireland have, as human rights commissions go, been taking a very leading role in that. So over to Michael to take us through that and the connection maybe with the SDGs and, and how sport contributes to the realization of, of people's human rights. Um, so over to you, Michael. Um, okay, uh, thanks very much for the, uh, the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'll very briefly just give a bit of an introduction to myself and my background, and then I'll get into what the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission does in relation to sports and human rights and some of the new things that we're planning for later this year. So uh, myself, before I joined the Human Rights Commission in uh, the summer of last year, I worked in sport for 22 years full time. Uh, I was director of sport for the Sports Council Northern Ireland and I was also director of football development at the Irish Football Association for uh, quite a while as well. So most of my time was working in the sport of football. Um, through that work in the football, the, the things that have sort of uh, got me inspired about sports and human rights would have been our football for all. Uh, campaign, which was really uh, funded through a peace program, and it was all about tackling issues around sectarianism, working with supporters, clubs, uh, trying to create a better culture, not just at the international games where there was a big issue with sectarian uh, chants and things like that, but also throughout the organisation, making sure that it celebrated diversity and inclusion. So things like girls football, uh, disability football were big, uh, part of what the Football for All strategy was about. Um, we also grew participation quite well. Uh, from about 2013 to 2021, we grew participation from 30,000 uh, young people involved in Irish FA programmes to over 70,000. And that was through uh, putting in place uh, a strategy uh, around youth development, which was peppered with inclusion goals and community targets. So there was a lot of work in that area. I was also very lucky to work with Tim um, through, through UEFA and Substance and, and work with Liam as well. So it was lovely to see the, those guys presenting today. And uh, the Irish FA, the Northern Irish FA, recently launched their findings around their social return on investment. So I was involved in that journey from the start, and it was great to see it recently launched as well. And it was brilliant to see you guys here today. Um, in relation to 
Me personally, I've always tried to champion uh, sport for all, sport and human rights uh, and inclusion in everything that I do. Um, in my spare time, I volunteer uh, for a charity, Survivors Over Suicide, and we do a lot of work with sports. Uh, I'm also head of uh, youth development for a large amateur club in Belfast. I'm on the board and was a founder of Street Soccer NI. It's a, a charity that uses football to help homeless people in disadvantaged groups. Uh, I'm also a founder and board member of World United, which is an intercultural uh, futsal team in Belfast, which was originally set up uh, to use football to tackle issues around racism. For my sins, I'm a referee in a league. It's a pan-disability uh, league, so I, I give up my time for that uh, as well, to support football for all uh, into the future. And I'm also chairperson of the, an the County Antrim uh, Super Cup team, so I look after a couple of elite squads, under 18, under 16. So you can sort of see that love uh, for sport is there. So when it comes to the Human Rights Commission, uh, one of the things that attracted me to the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission was they've been involved in sports and human rights since 2016. The chief executives, very passionate about how sport uh, can be used to promote human rights. He's worked very closely with the Commonwealth Games. Um, he's also worked with the Centre for Sport and Human Rights quite a bit, and there's been lots of international roundtables around sports and human rights where our, our chief executive, Dr. Russell, has contributed. Um, when the Commonwealth Games were in Rwanda, um, David also uh, facilitated a discussion amongst all the human rights institutions who were there to talk about what could be done around sports and human rights as well. We have an established uh, sports forum around sports and human rights, which I was a member of before I joined the Human Rights um, Commission. I was a member when I was working in football. And I knew from that that the commission were very serious about uh, sport and human rights. That forum meets four times a year. Um, at the tail end of last year, we had a session around the rights of the child. In February this year, we've got a forum looking at gender identity. And we have uh, Simon Croft from, from Gendered Intelligence uh, giving a bit of a keynote speech. And then we'll have some athletes who have been on a journey uh, who are transgender uh, athletes and intersex athletes telling their stories so that our forum members can learn from that. That topic, again, came from the forum members who, who were keen to learn more about those issue, issues. Um, also, what's new this year, we have a conference around sports and human rights, which is happening on the 8th of March, which is International Women's Day. Um, Catherine's going to be one of our speakers on that day, and um, we're, we're basically looking at how we can empower uh, and show young student teachers and young grassroots coaches how they can use human rights when they're planning their sessions or planning development plans and giving them toolkits uh, for that in the future. Most of the speakers on the day will be female, so we're also going to have a, a panel discussion about the rise of girls and women in sport as well. Um, a part of my job that I really love is going into schools and community groups uh, and talking to them about sports and human rights. You get a lot of interaction. Kids are really switched on, I think, about these issues, and um, we get a lot from that as well. Part of my job is to take some of that feedback and feed it into our new strategy moving forward as well. Uh, another new thing that we do is we go into prisons um, and we work with the Irish FA uh, Stay On Side team, and we also work with Ulster University to deliver sports and human rights workshops. Now, in Northern Ireland, because of the troubles, uh, we have a, pr a prison system where there's separated prisoners, where there may be top um, ex-IRA men or ex-GVF paramilitary sort of uh, people. Usually, they don't engage in, in programs from outside the prison. They want this, this program about sports and human rights, so that shows you the reach. Um, in relation to partners, we work with all the sports. Uh, we work with community groups, charities, uh, Monster Technological University, Ulster University, uh, NSPCC, Sport Against Racism Ireland, um, ENRI, which is a European uh, network of human rights institutions, and we also work with the Commonwealth Forum. Um, there is so much happening in this area. Uh, it's a pleasure to be involved today. Um, moving forward, another new thing we'll do is podcast, the sort of shine the spotlight on sports and human rights uh, groups across Northern Ireland that are doing innovative work. I went through that as quickly as I could because Pat told me, I said I had 10 minutes, and Pat from the GAA said you've got five. So I tried to go through that as quickly as I could. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you.
Okay, so we're coming to a finish of this, Philip. I know you're probably waiting in the backdrop there for me to finish up, but just to mention that the UNESCO Chair MTU has developed a suite of resources to facilitate better reporting on human rights and sport. And Gerard is going to pop it, or Sarah, or Ashling will pop it in the chat box. It hasn't got out around the world so much yet, but it really is a very easy, easy guides, easy to understand as to how to report on human rights and sport, what the link is with SDGs, what's the purpose of it, what's the value of it, why you should do it, when you should do it, and how you should do it. So very clear guides uh, available there for everyone around the world, free of charge, and we'd encourage you to have a look at those and see what you can do. But by encouraging better reporting on how human rights and sport connect, we can again advance the finance uh, and finance for development side. Um, so Philip, I'm going to pass back over to you. I know we're back into the discussion section now. We do have, for those of you in the room, we do have our reception. If you have a question or you'd like to stay for the discussion, please feel free to do so. I can see them waiting at the door for people for our reception. We have a very good great sportsmanship talk coming from Paul Smith, who's at the back of the room. I'd absolutely encourage you to, to listen in for that and we also have our photo competition which has run for the last two months we've applicants from all around the world uh, entered into that photo competition and we'll have a short show of the results of the photo competition there's food and drinks available for you so philip over to you to run the discussion and thank you very much thank, thank you so, so much uh, catherine and thank you so much for all the panelists that intervened today i think it was a super inspiring uh, mix of interventions that have really shown, as I said in the opening, that we have done our homework in the sport for development movement. And it's now time to benefit from the capital and the assets we have been creating uh, uh, that are relevant for investors uh, to mobilize these investors on this basis, which is very robust. Um, we come to the last agenda item now which is Q's and A's. And uh, uh, I think the time is very short. I know that you have in Dubai, at least, a wonderful reception ahead, and I don't want to be too much in the way. But um, I, I think uh, uh, there have been, hasn't been enough time for many of the people in the room to fully understand and grasp the very solid and complex, somehow complex innovations that have been presented today. And so I think the questions and answer session is a good opportunity for all of you to, to raise questions. This will be done for technical reasons, not uh, by oral interventions, but through the chat function. And I have my colleagues, uh, uh, Daniel and Antonio, ready to uh, help me uh, um, that, uh, uh, that uh, I, I take into consideration all the questions you may have in light of the session. So please use the chat function and the Q&A functions to uh, raise questions you may wish to ask. While uh, we wait for these questions to be asked, I would like to invite Juan Pablo Salazar, who is the head of uh, programs for persons with disability at the Latin American Development Bank, uh, uh, CAF, to come in and make a short statement. Juan Pablo, you have the floor. Phil Philip, thank you very much. Um, I will be very fast. I also don't want to be in between of the people in Dubai and their drinks. Uh, but as you say, it's been a very inspiring uh, session. Uh, from the CAF, the Latin American uh, Bank of Development, we've been following these advances very close. Uh, Katsumata-san mentioned the coalition of sports for development, and we've been in discussions with Matthew to make sure to make sure uh, CAF becomes a formal part of this coalition, hopefully very soon. Uh, you mentioned uh, Liam, Liam and Tim were trailblazers. I, I think that's an understatement. They're magicians. They truly found the philosophical stone of this discussion because why do we want to be part of the coalition? Because we believe deeply that sports is the most efficient tool for social transformation. Uh, so we're looking forward to pilot this in the Latin American region and hopefully with the UNESCO chair uh, have a, a social return of investment model specific for per persons with disabilities. We love that uh, this is outcome oriented and we hope to pilot this soon so we can bring new data and stronger data to the table that proves that causality between uh, uh, sports for persons with disabilities and uh, sustainable development goals and more specifically the UN convention on the rights 
of people with disabilities. So thank you very much for this session. It has been music through my ears. Uh, it's all thanks to the great leadership of UNESCO, Philip, as you mentioned, the, the fact of having Gabriela Ramos opening the, the giving opening remarks uh, speaks about the level of importance and priority that this has uh, within UNESCO. So we're looking very much forward to uh, further develop this. And uh, we strongly believe in the outcomes model uh, of investment. So thank you very much. And you can count with CAF moving forward. Thank you so much, Juan Pablo. This is almost a, a good closing remark, but we still want uh, participants to, to, uh, to have a chance to ask questions. I have noted two, but I also wanted to remind the audience. This event is a key milestone in informing and preparing a specific session with development banks at the forthcoming conference, World Conference of Sport Ministers uh, in June this year, MINEPS 7. And this session is an important milestone in informing that session we want the forthcoming World Conference of Sport Ministers to encourage sport ministers with respect to challenges they face, especially in developing countries, uh, when it comes to resource mobilization for the many mandates we are putting on their shoulders. And these mandates, sport for development events, cannot be carried out by sport ministers alone. They only can be carried out if sport ministers are provided with pathways to other uh, ministries within the government, health, education, social inclusion, economy and finance, if possible, and also with pathways to uh, uh, bilateral and multilateral funding sources, as well as funding from the business community. This is why this discussion, why the investment discussion is so important, because we all agree in this room that Sport for Development is a business case, but we need to help sport ministries, especially on the occasion of this conference, to uh, take the necessary steps and to find solutions. I will now um, um, uh, just read out what in this context is key in terms of informing the forthcoming MINEPS conference. Number one, how data can be mobilized to accelerate and scale sport funding. Data. How sport funding demonstrably supports sustainable development outcomes. And we've heard a good number of uh, examples and interventions today that directly address address this question right now. Who to approach when looking for new funding opportunities? The relationship between sport for development and human rights, a better sense of the current landscape of investment in sport for development. A lot of answers to these questions have been provided through the presentations. And I uh, uh, understand, Catherine, that in the room there may be questions that could be asked directly, and so I, I give priority to the room before you all move to your wonderful reception. Catherine, is that right? Are there questions that are asked in the room in Dubai? On to the reception. I appreciate you have a lot of questions online, and we have the chat function, which we can catch up on answers to later. But if there are questions in the room, we can present them maybe first. And if there are not questions in the room at this, at this moment, we can move on to the reception, and Philip can continue with his discussion with participants online. So anyone got a burning question from the room? Okay, Philip, we have no burning questions from the room. So, because to be fair, a lot of questions were answered in all the sessions this afternoon, and I think that's testament to the quality of the speakers and the amount of information that came forward. So for those of you who are in the room, I invite you to head on out to our reception. We have a youth group called IROC, and we have Fion Fionathan, Fionn and his dad playing music out there. We also have food and drinks, so and a talk from Paul Smith um, at half past, followed by our photo competition. So thank you very much, Philip, and all the participants in today's session. It was a fantastic session so uh, credit to you and your team for all the organization went that went into to that session thank you very much thank you very much catherine we feel a little left behind here in the virtual space uh, seeing you leave for for the reception but uh, please those who are still in the virtual room uh, be with us it won't be long anymore before uh, uh, you all walk away i wanted to pay tribute to daniel greenways who has been working with me in organizing this session and has done a fantastic job in preparing the program and in mobilizing the different uh, panelists and advising them. So thanks, Daniel, for, for, for this tremendous help. Now I have in the chat function uh, two questions that have been asked by uh, a very well used leader uh, uh, in the field of sport for development. Maureen Rosita Ojong, Ejob Besong, 
uh, Maureen, you are always there, and I'm I'm very grateful for that. Uh, you have been also intervening in our CJEP session in 2022. Your second question, I have a hard time going back to the first one, is what strategies are put in place by governments in their collaborations with UN agencies and international development agencies to ensure that sports for development initiatives develop for the African continent are driven and implemented in majority with local experts to ensure knowledge shared, economic empowerment, and to ensure that this initiative implemented, initiatives implemented are adapted or adaptable to the realities of the local context and specific needs of communities. That's a very important question. And as you know, you, uh, UNESCO has two institutional priorities, which are first, Africa, and second, gender equality. And so we at UNESCO headquarters are striving to ensure exactly what you say, the ownership by Africa of its sport for development agenda, but also a strong participation of Africa in the international collective work around the subjects that the subjects that have been discussed today we do this notably by working very closely with the african union and the african union sports council but we also try for example in connection with the global observatory on women and sport that has just been established in switzerland and that is directed by an indian expert to uh, uh, ensure that from the outset in the design of the plans and strategies of these observatories african experts are on board and this is a call it's not just we have no answer because this is a, a continuous challenge and it's never going to be completely assumed and uh, um, met by what we can do from paris headquarters we do have a number of regional offices in africa unesco has uh, uh, that are increasingly engaged in sport and increasingly engaged with the local uh, uh, and national uh, stakeholders in the African continent. So this is the second layer. First, African Union has a mandate such as UNESCO, a regional mandate concerning sports for development in the African continent. You may all know that a sport for development strategy is going to be finalized by the African Union in the very near future. Um, we have the African Union Sports Council that is more operational and more dealing, especially with the data dimension of sports for development is, is therefore a very important partner for us. And that council has uh, uh, sub-regional chapters in all the main regions in this huge continent. So again, we are dealing here with a very, very big constituency, and it is not going to, uh, uh, to be easy to fully involve African experts and to identify these experts uh, in the right time frame. And so this is going to be a priority also of our Fit for Life program in which we want to build capacity uh, in all regions, especially in the developing countries, to ensure that the knowledge and expertise gap between South and North is not increased through this initiative, but considerably diminished. And that must be done by specific capacity building initiatives around Fit for Life, notably around the gathering and the use of data concerning sport for development. This is a very short answer to a very big issue um, and uh, I call upon all those uh, participants from the African continent who are attending this meeting to help us with this by suggesting experts, su suggesting networks that can help us ensuring that we are not stepping in into what should be really the ownership and the initiative of African stakeholders themselves. This is the answer, uh, Maureen, I provide to your Second question, I'm now opening my Word document where Daniel and Antonio have uh, very well recapped the questions. Let me just find that again. And I think it pertained to traditional sports. So Maureen, you also asked, what work is being done by African governments in the sports coalition to ensure that traditional African sports are codified and promoted in a way that really engages a big part of the population. That again is a, is a tricky question uh, because the sports coalition of development banks, because that's uh, if there's a coalition, I guess you refer to the coalition of development banks for sustainable development through sport, is first and foremost a coalition amongst the development banks. 
So the focus we have right now in the coalition is to support the banks in developing an action plan that has been already proposed and is about to be implemented. It is about social outcome contracting, as you have heard, which we feel is the best proposition for innovators in this sphere to have safe investments. And it will depend on the local context of the development banks and the governments with whom we work to see what are the core outcomes we want to achieve in this local context around health, around education, around social inclusion. And how can we build in what is the best answer or the best possibility for involving sports and sports for development organizations in delivering these outcomes? At this stage, it is very important that the proof of concept phase succeeds. We are not going to have these uh, initial projects at large scale. These are proof of concept uh, 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 in a proof of concept phase. And we need to go for what I would call low hanging fruit for uh, situations in which we know we can have sufficiently robust data that will convince both the pre investors, but also the outcome payers, i.e. the development banks in this case, that their return on investment will be achieved and that the outcomes at which we are aiming will be will be achieved. UNESCO is strongly promoting the role of traditional sports, not just in Africa, but especially in Africa. And this is, of course, a link between our sport mandate and our culture mandate. And you may know that a number of sports disciplines, traditional sport disciplines, have been recognized by UNESCO as intangible cultural heritage. So we are very sensitive to the role of traditional sports in achieving development outcomes. And we will ensure that when we are going to launch within the context of the coalition, um, the, the pilot projects, that if traditional sports are an effective solution to reach the outcomes for these pilot projects, that we include them in the portfolio of interventions that will be organized in these local contexts. This is uh, uh, pertaining to your question for the coalition. More broadly speaking, as I said, we have been promoting, for example, the creation by the African Union of an alliance of traditional sports in Africa last year. And we want to strongly support the inclusion of traditional sports in national sports strategies. And indeed, they are still neglected. A lot of pressure is put on sport ministers for uh, citizens to participate in sports competitions, for uh, organizing sports competitions, and for succeeding in major sports competitions. Hence, a lot of effort right now in the sport ecosystem from the government side, from the sport ministers, needs to go and goes into elite sport. And this, of course, uh, discriminates traditional sports and the role of traditional sports uh, at the grassroots sport level. As you know, UNESCO's uh, um, mantra and focus for decades now has been grassroots sport. We know that grassroots sport brings about the most significant economic and social returns for uh, the countries that are our member states. And here, traditional sports have a very important role as grassroots sport in terms of accessibility, in terms of sustaining values and, and, and learning uh, between generations, and also in, in terms of more uh, uh, pricely, less costly infrastructures that uh, need to be put in place for practicing traditional sports. So in the broader context of sport for development within our mandate, we strongly promote this role of uh, traditional sports, especially in the African continent, where we know there's a diversity and where these sports, traditional sports are still very lively practice of citizens in the African countries. I hope that replies to your question, Maureen, for which I thank you. And now I look in the chat and elsewhere where I find more questions. Yes. I move down. Maureen thanks me. So I just got two questions and two thank yous for Maureen. Thank you, Maureen, for thanking me. And I see no further questions. And I think uh, we have been now having an extended session on measurement and finance uh, for sustainable, uh, for sport for development. Excuse me. I thank you all for your patience. I thank again all the panelists for the brilliant presentations, especially those panelists who are not used to this setting, uh, which is mainly intergovernmental organizations, governments, and uh, uh, all those practitioners who have been 
talking towards the concrete impact we want to have through sport and have through sport. I remember Joe uh, in my session with extremely moving uh, stories and quotations, but also uh, the stories and the the examples were heard from Mauritius, from um, Namibia, from Northern Ireland. I'm mixing all these countries now, and I will certainly forget important ones uh, from the ASEAN in the regional context. Uh, and of course, from all those who are pioneering work in the social outcome contracting space. Thanks for also for the development banks who joined us today. You are all pioneers and you are still rather alone in the room. And uh, we want you to be more and more uh, in company of your peers of other development banks. And I think we are all convinced we have a, a business case to present. Um, and we have robust data also thanks to UEFA and the expert consortium from UEFA spearheading the work on the social return on investment through sport and being very open source about it and being available to repurpose, if I may say this word, their experts and their expertise for other local contexts. I thank you for that. I'm sure this is the beginning of a journey that will be extremely beneficial to all those we want sport to, to help in their lives. And I thank again for uh, the Irish, Irish leadership in organizing this event. We will have another session uh, about Fit for Life tomorrow, and also we will participate in the session on human rights and sport, the mandate tomorrow. So please come back tomorrow for these sessions and have a very good afternoon, evening, night, or end of the morning. Thank you very much.